And I'm coming now on my roof, leaving, don't give a fuck, I don't care, uh, did it for my lonesome, no wonder now I'm on one, no shortcuts on that long run, all I really want is my share. Hey guys, this is Matt Winning. And I'm Jeff Nichols. And we are going to talk today about how to not only train for the military, but how to keep this going for life. And what I really wanted to get at today, guys, is we're not only going to show you how to get better at everything you're going to be testing for, but also how to maintain a lot of this stuff as you retire. As you all know, this is very, very important to maintaining health, performance, and also reducing stress. So what I want you guys to understand is this video is not only if you could be all the way from a general to a guy that's just coming into the military, it doesn't matter. This video will apply to you. Now, my background is I have been a contractor with the U.S. Army under Airborne Division, Ranger Regiment, 4th Infantry, I've also been a part of Border Patrol and wrote workouts for Israeli Special Forces. Yeah, my background, again, like I, I very similar, I suppose, but I started my career as a strength coach. Uh, spent 11 years in the Navy. Uh, it was a, a SEAL Team 5, and I was at Dev Group uh, in Virginia Beach. And I was deployed many, many times. And the really interesting thing happened is like the last 18 months of my career, um, the human performance program was kind of set up in SOCOM and JSOC. And it just so happened because of my background as a strength coach and as a SEAL, they're like, hey, this guy could go help us hire the right folks. So I was tasked to go out um, for SOCOM and JSOC and start populating uh, the civilians like yourself to take over this position. Because as I was in active duty, like the way I saw it was like, well, we've got to use the civilian knowledge to bring it in to share that knowledge in the military so that way the military can own that knowledge and create longevity. Yeah, what we're talking and that's about. where you guys have to understand is that the military has always fell backwards on physical readiness. They tried their best, and they do have a big problem. They have yeah. lots and lots of people that yeah. they need to fix yeah. up. So I get it. But at the end of the day, the reason I was brought into all of these different branches I'm telling you about, injury prevention. Yeah. What we started to realize was that 33% of any branch is non-deployable. And that's a, that's a percentage that a lot of people don't know and they don't want to hear. Yeah, and I would say that's probably even like a favorable, favorable one because it's like you're not taking into account the ones that are like their MOSs or the rates that are like pure combat. So if you look at like that 33%, that's an intermixing of not just the administrative necessary in the military, but you're talking about the combat ready units. I think it's, it's probably even higher than yeah, that. Yeah, we're being generous with that number. But I've seen, especially at 4th Infantry, my highest amount of guys that I was in charge of was 6,500. And I would say half the injuries I saw was from poor training selections. Yeah. They were running too much. They didn't understand anything about mobility, posterior chain, injury preventative stuff. It was all, hi, I don't really know what to do, even though I'm in charge of PT, I'm gonna go run the shit out of it. Right, yeah, and I think one of the biggest mistakes um, that, that tends to happen from my viewpoint is that a lot of times, especially when we were talking about special forces side a little bit, but that kind of bleeds in is like, you know, guys coming into selection or guys going to boot camp initially, like there is an intensity associated with getting ready that doesn't necessarily need to be maintained after graduating boot camp, getting out of the academy, getting out of even selection, special forces selection. It's like it, 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 there is a mentality, understandably, in the military. It's like go, go, go. But with the military that is so good at objective thinking, right? Skydiving, shooting, you know, uh, firearms, demolition, diving. Those are very objectively high skill driven things. And so I look at like resistance training, for example, and go, it fits perfectly. Like it's it. This is a very objectively driven passion profession that we we have. So it's like. We, I see this being a perfect fit in our tactical space, which makes me scratch my head wondering why it's not, why, why we're in such a poor state. Well, I think the biggest reason is, is we have transition of leadership too often. Yep. You talked about General Abrams setting you down, showing you, hey, we're going to keep this rolling, and as soon as Abrams retires, <laughs> as soon as he retires, his art, right, gone. And so yeah. that's where you guys are going to have to understand that a lot of this is going to be taken upon not only yourselves, but as you might be rising up the ranks, mm -hmm. right, yeah. you are going to need to make sure that your guys have resiliency and have strength and have 
all these other things that we want to show you in this video to make sure that you not only make great selections on what you're going to do with resistance training, but also how to point out, see, and detect weak links so that we can make better selections and not yes. hurt somebody. Because yep. the worst thing about a non-performing soldier is an injured soldier. You bet. Right? So let's take a look at some of these graphs here. Almost 50% of the military experience one or more injury per year. That's pretty big. This is a result of 2 million medical encounters annually across medical and military services. 2 million. They require 90 to 120 more days of restricted work or lost time in addition to cost of treatment. So why is this important? Well, I think, honestly, if you wanted to save billions of dollars, you would just be changing the way that you approach physical readiness in the Army. Right. Because, it's, it's, again, it goes back to that objectivity. It's like, you know, if you look at sport and the civilian world and things like, and I even talked about this in one of your videos before about, like, why the Russian model, but it's, 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 it's a real pure collection of analytics, right? Mm -hmm. Where else do you get a really good, like, collection of analytics than our military, fire department, whatever you want to say, that because you've got them all the time. Well, you see them all the time. And it's very, it's very true of why I started to slowly pull away from military help and went into the fire service because a fire chief, when he gets in as in charge of a fire department, he's there for 10 years. Right, yeah. Versus yeah. how long does somebody stay in charge? Yeah, usually of maybe two if you're lucky at those, you know, those flag officer levels, right? And so I think that that's the thing is this, this all comes back and it has to come back to educating, right? Our, yeah. our, our senior leadership, but also our senior enlisted leadership because it, it, it all have the military understand, like I get it, like they have to keep everything in, in, yeah. in house to yeah. a point, right? Yeah. And, and, and I think that's the goal, and that's what we're trying to offer is like, there's a multitude of different things we could do and have people do, but first we gotta do is create a really good base. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's our goal. Well, this is coming from Ar Army Injury Prevention and Public Health Center for the Army. More than half of these injuries are exercise and sports related due to improper training modalities, yep. especially with an emphasis on this, their own paper, especially running, and we both know that the reason that running is causing all these issues is lack of strength and overuse. Yep. Period, yep. end of story. Yep. Back, shoulder, and knees are also common and more often associated with lifting heavy objects in awkward positions. Yep. Ah, oh, weird. <laughs> so what we're gonna show you guys is how to train today, not only using variable systems with variable positions, but also how to attack these lifting parameters in the safest way right. possible with the biggest results. Yeah. Cause I mean, that's the group, like it, it, we have to create these, these movements. And I think the thing is like, we have a guy that's shooting a rifle or a firearm, right? There are some very objective mechanical positional things we want them to do. And I think that that's the goal too is like, I think for you and I, we got to step back sometimes and realize like not everyone knows has been on the bar as much as we have. Mm -hmm. So just teaching the basics is as unsexy as it may be. Yeah. Right. That's really what we're talking about yep. is creating these really good foundations that create longevity, that create health, that create resiliency. Right. Specifically for orthopedic issues that we we know are chronic. And this is what's wild. I'm 43. I know you're I'm 43 as well. He's 43, <laughs> and I guarantee you that both of us could physically dominate 90% of the Army right now. We and, should be. and we are theoretically 20 years past our prime right, yeah. from what the military says in their own shit. Yeah. So now what I want to get at is we're looking at this graph here now. Um, this is really interesting. If there's no loss of time for the injury, it still costs $1,300. If it's a day away from work, so let's say we have to schedule out a day from work, guy hurts his ankle, he's out for the day, that costs $2,400 a day. And now if it's a hospital visit and it's a hospital day, right. it's upwards of $10,000 per day. This is what's crazy. A severe injury that would cause a disability in the Army costs the US military service $2.2 million, per. regardless of what their stature was. Right, regardless of where they fall in line of rank and right. years. And so I'm gonna use this as an estimation and I'm sure he can back this. You're a basic infantry guy. I would say you're probably worth somewhere between two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars per guy mm -hmm. as a total value. But what if you're in dev group or you're a SEAL team with all that training, three five million? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that's the thing is like you know we can crack this nut of like why are we doing this? Like we can we can talk. It's money, money issue, money issue. That's and there's value in that because the military is trying to 
create value and that save money, make money, whatever it is. But the thing too is like what we're looking at is like we're going to really attack this from a standpoint of health. Like the numbers, the, the expenses show the lack of health. Yes. And now our target is to improve health. Yes. Right. And these numbers, it's like we, we know they're out there and we, we know they can be resolved because there's places that you've been involved in and places that I've been involved in that there's been a, a darn near resolution to those sort of big numbers. Yeah, and I don't know how many times, especially when I worked with Ranger Regiment, we were big into fighting in Afghanistan when I was big in the Army, and one person dying cost $8.7 million to the to the department. Yeah. Now, I don't know how many guys I had coming back because we trained them smarter, we got them stronger. They got tears in their eyes going, if you wouldn't have made me as strong as I would, I'd be coming back in a body bag too. Yeah, and that's exactly like, what, it's a weird thing. Like, that is exactly was the driving factor for me to train the way I did. When I was in, and that's the driving factor for me to do, and you as well, like, to, why are we doing this for our military? It's yeah. like, we, it's, it's not a matter, we're not trying to complain. What we do is have perspective, not only as coaches, but, like, longevity in that perspective. We've seen these military units over time, and we've seen degradation over time, and now we have the numbers to substantiate it. Yeah, and the big thing is, guys, is this... We could talk about money all day long, but what we really want out of you guys is to be able to do high performance movements with low mileage so you're not paying for it because eventually you will be out. You're yes. out. Yep. I'm done. I'm retired from powerlifting. You didn't pay too much for being a SEAL team guy. I didn't pay too much for breaking right. world records. Why is that? Yeah, Smarts. Right? Like that. That. Like, yes, I've been injured. Yes, I know you've been injured, but I think like that's not the that's not the thing the question yeah. isn't are do we he and i have drive and he and i aren't actually going does the military have the right people to do it yes we do but yeah, absolutely that's why we do it like if there's an organization that has people that are really driven it is our it is our tactical population yeah i just think we need to just kind of focus in the drive start looking at some of the injury rates and developing a system in a scenario that we can change what's going on so we're going to get to that in this this movie and video we want to show you guys really how to train super smart and we're going to hammer into you guys as much as we can so that you guys get the biggest bang for your buck and the biggest reduction of mileage with the highest level of performance you bet that's it rock and roll okay guys so one of the first exercises they're going to do in the new army testing is the trap bar deadlift so what we're going to do is we're going to go over the trap bar deadlift and although to jeff and i Doing 340 for three, we could do that in our sleep with missing a hand and, and you know probably half of a leg. We're gonna show you how you can master this test and explode these numbers easily. This is, this is not hard for somebody that even puts a little half-assed training in. But there are some key pitfalls for training incorrectly, and we wanna make sure that your not, deadlift not only looks perfect, but also has the best leverages. So let's get to it. All right, so there's some key variables that we wanna make perfect when we do trap bar deadlifts. The first thing is selecting the right foot placement. Now, for most of you guys, you're gonna to wanna to put your feet right under your shoulders and you're gonna have your toes pointed a little bit more straight and maybe depending on your hip flexibility of toes out just a hair. Now, you can see everything looks very linear. Everything looks totally natural, okay? He's not in super close. He's not out super wide. He's put perfectly where his body and symmetry is, is just right. Now, this is where everybody makes a mistake. When you go down to grab the trap bar, you want to go down in a squat. Do not just lean over and pick up the bar. Because every little rep, especially if you're a beginner watching this, even when you eccentrically go down to grab something incorrectly, it's still teaching your body how to do it wrong. So what we do is we squat down to the bar. So what you're going to see is he is going to keep most of his pressure mid-foot, maybe even a little bit more to the heel as he's learning, right? not the toe. Now, as he reaches down to grab the bar, he's going to keep his back completely straight. He is going to get the midsection of the bar. So now his hands are locked right in the center of that grip point. Now, before he goes to lift, there's some key variables. He's going to try to have his shoulders back. He's going to keep his head slightly neutral. And everybody has a little bit of difference. I like to be more here, but you can be there if that's comfortable. The key is this straight back. So come back here and take a look at this. His back is as straight as an arrow, and he's got his butt tilted out. It's not tucked under. So now as he lifts, he's going to lift from here, from the trap. That's going to force him to be in perfect position. 
If he forces this lat tightness, his back is going to be very difficult to round. So now as he lowers it, he's going to do it the same way that he picked it up. Keep his head slightly neutral, maybe slightly up, and he's going to stay on his heels with his back arched. So you can see, look at that. Perfect. Look at the spinal erector development. This is what your back needs to look like if you want to be a strong soldier, okay? So he's going to do it again. Let's set it down. Notice he's not slamming it on the ground. He's controlling the reps. This is very important to learn. You're going to learn just as much picking it up as you are setting it down. Good. Awesome. Now, the next thing that we want to talk about is what you're going to see when you're doing something wrong. Now, 20 years ago, when Jeff and I first started to become super beefcakes, you didn't have the ability to take your phone out and shoot a 4K video. Most of the videos I have of me doing my 1,000 plus pound squats are pretty hazy and messed up as pre-2010. So now what we're going to do is show some key problems that you're going to see not only in some of your platoons and some of your groups of people, but if you're doing this on your own to try to get ready before you even get to the military. So the first thing he's going to do is he's going to set up the same way he has set up. So he remembered that. He's going to grab the bar in the same area that he grabbed. He's going to remember that. Now what he's going to do, instead of thinking about, he's going to have his back rounded. So you see this? This is putting three times the pressure on his lumbars to lift the same weight. Now, as Jeff's going to tell you here right now, so Jeff's just going to stand up. And what we're going to talk about now is why do we see this in this general population? We see this because people don't have manual labor jobs and they sit in desks all day. Mm -hmm. True. So the point is, is that when you guys are first learning how to do these trap bar deadlifts, you're going to have to overcome a lot of your developmental issues. The reason that the lower back likes to round is it creates a shorter lever arm for the legs that don't have to work as hard. Yeah. And it hides hip weaknesses, which we are going to focus on tremendously in this video. So if you see your back rounding like that, so he's going to pick it up incorrectly. This is probably the biggest thing you're going to see. Round it back. Now he's going to lift it from there. Notice his knees straighten out first. His back's rounded, it's, it's thrusted forward, his chest isn't up, he's gonna set it down. Now, the next big thing you're gonna see probably is you're gonna see the ass shoot up first. This means the quads are too strong for the posterior chain, which is not only gonna cause a deadlift injury, it's probably gonna affect your running, sprinting, and jumping. Now, if you're trying to be in special forces or even basic army, your sprinting, running, and jumping might be the chances of you living or dying. So this is very, very important. So now we're going to watch his butt shoot up first. So you can see he turned it into a warning movement. His butt shot up first, his back rounded. This means that his knees are very strong and his glutes and hamstrings are lagging. This is also another very, very common problem that you need to fix immediately before you get strong. Because guess what? You start training like this with incorrect form, it's not gonna get better when you get stronger, it's gonna get worse. The body likes to find its strengths and avoid its weaknesses, and technique is the one way that you're gonna be able to see those if you have a trained eye, and that's what this video is gonna help you with. Another exercise that both of us see just dogged out and done incorrectly is the basic push-up. And there is some pretty big things that you need to be remembering when you're doing these push-ups, and not only get the maximum amount of reps, which is 62 reps, but also do it and not damage your body. Right, you know, we talked earlier, Bill, about like, you know, when you're testing on the push-up, there's a speed component to it, because you're saying you need to do as many push-ups as you can in a window that drives an energy system, which is your, you know, it's like we need power and speed, you know? So when it comes to the push-up too, and we'll get into the programming later on, but this is really talking a good push-up, not only will build some muscular endurance, but it's a really good way to manage, like in the same way we try to manage ground force for the ankles, right, when we run, it's like we need to be able to really manage like, like pummeling force, hand climbing, all these sort of things, then you need some dynamic power there. Absolutely. So speed is, speed is a good, good component of this. But So from a positional standpoint, like keep it super simple, probably like you, first thing is hands. Right. right, like, and this is transferable to a bar or really, really anything, I guess, for that when you're gonna be pressing. For me, it's like, in the same way, like you see where someone has a dominant foot, you stand behind and push them and they, they step. Like I kind of have people like go, uh, they'll fall into where they yep. can catch. So notice he fall down, so get on your knees when you guys are doing this, and he's just gonna put his hands where he feels like his best to fall to. That's probably gonna be his perfect position. It's real natural, and you see it's not too wide, it's not too narrow. We could get into the biomechanics of this, but 
going too wide is going to cause a lot of anterior shoulder rotation, which is a big problem in the military yeah. because they don't have any tricep strength. Yeah. When you optimize your hand position, you're going to be able to keep it in the elbow, which the elbow is going to take a lot more of an ass whooping than the shoulder long term. Yeah. Remember, we want you guys to be able to do the same thing you can do at 20 years old at 55. So yeah. that means mileage has to play a key part yes. in this too. Yeah. So he's going to fall down and he's going to find his position. So he's falling, boom, there's his spot. Now what he's going to do is when he gets his body set, the first thing he's going to lock is his lats. His lat locking is going to force his body to stay in a perfect position right here. Now he is a piece of granite to be able to push through. Now he's going to go down and then the army is going to tell you they're going to have to release the hand. Then bring the hand back, press. He's going to drop, release the hands, press. Now he's going to show you the speed in which he would do to get, let's just do 20. He's going to do 20 of them if he was going to try to break the the, the, total, the time. Yeah, if we're going to do, you're doing your tested push-up for two minutes or whatever that parameter may be. Like One of the big things I like to do is, I, I, I pulled this from the powerlifting world. I say, get in your starting blocks. And what I mean kind of is like, we, if, you're, if you're in a squat rack, you're going to take a minute to get get stable before you go. Yeah. And that's a real important thing when it comes to speed if, with repetition. Your solid position is more readily be, be, to be able to be reproduced because you're creating stability from a biomechanic position that can produce force. So what he's telling you guys is as you get more tired, if your stability and your, your ruggedness is not strong, you're gonna make small errors, which are not gonna lower your number, but increase your injury rate. You betcha. And that's kind of like, the, that's the unsexy side of this is like, hey, get really stable so you can move with maximal efficiency and speed. Yeah. If that's the test, then that's the test. And so in this case, I'm gonna get my hands in the best position. And I always say get, I, I load my lats, but I always say get over the drop zone. I kind of lean my body over to where, essentially if I had a bar, that bar would touch, mm -hmm. okay? And then I make sure my butt is tight the whole time. Mm -hmm. Like, because if my body is descending and this apex of my fingers is my hips, if I'm descending and my hips are still falling when I'm trying to push the opposite way, biomechanically, that's a nightmare. That's a bleeding, yeah. a ton of bleeding of energy. Yeah. And that's why we need to stay stable so we can move quick. So what we want, what Jeff's trying to tell you guys, we want you to be an I-beam and not a piece of foam, right? Yeah. You need to be solid as a brick so that everything you're doing is transferring the energy to the movement and making it the most efficient and strongest. It has no difference in powerlifting. No. So yeah. this is all the same, guys. Yeah. You have to be able to brace. Yes. So he's teaching you these bracing secrets. Yeah. So I, I make it systematic, just like I do step by step. First thing I do is I ground my hands. I get my hands where they're comfortable. Next thing I do is I get my lats engaged. I push my body forward until it, you see my elbows, my, my triceps will fire. My humerus rotates in just a little bit. Like we get rid of the armpits just a little bit. Now I'm gonna squeeze my glutes, okay? And this gives me a position to, after I get my first rep, now I can work Five, speed. Six, seven, eight. And as nine, long as nine, I hold this position 11, and stay 12, tight, 13, 14, I don't 15, lose 16, 17, any of 18, the force 19, 20, 21. I'm creating. So as you can see, it's super efficient. So basically what he did is make a standard, perfect push-up the most efficient it possibly could be. And that could be power thing, that can be getting ready for this kind of stuff. The, the issue is, is guys, you have to learn to stay tight. All the tricks we just showed you on the trap or delve is learning how to be efficient and tight and use the right muscles. He just showed you the same thing on the push-up, and this is how you can get as many reps, and he could smoke the top level right now, and we're just messing around shooting a video. So again, learn how to stay tight, and that's gonna help your push-up. So key points, get your hands, a little bit closer in your shoulder, tuck the elbow, and be in a position where you're mechanically efficient. And remember, like he just said, the push-up is not just your upper body, it's learning to lock your entire body and create it as one thing. I can tell you straight out, my best bench press was 615 pounds in competition with my feet up and no leg drive and no glute squeeze, 550, 10% difference. So if we look at it in reps, not using your lower body and keeping it tight, is gonna take you from 62 to probably in the 40s. It, it, it'll drop you so substantially because, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's why we don't use a, you know rubber, like we don't have a baseball bat where the handle is solid and the top is soft or vice versa. Like, it doesn't matter how stable my upper body is, but if my lower body isn't reciprocating that, that, that stability, 
Well, the upper body doesn't have a chance. It's like having loose hands on a squat. Like you will never be able to stabilize your lower body if your upper body is creating a lot of balance issues. Exactly. So you guys just learned all the tricks of the trade to be a big bench, be a big push-up person. Yep. So, all right, there's that. The next exercise that we need to hit on, which is gonna tie in really good with the push-ups, kind of tying into it anyway, is the plank. And I'm glad this is one test that I think the military should have been doing a long time ago. I think the plank has more relevance than the sit-up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I think that the relevance too wasn't even intentional. No. <laughs> no, I think they're like, hey, this isn't gonna hurt anybody. But it Let's actually really, one, it, right? it's good, yeah. But the plank is all about learning how to brace and that's gonna help the trap bar deadlift, that's gonna help the push-up, it's gonna help the med ball throw, it's gonna help the sled drags, all the testing you're gonna have to do is gonna be involving these muscles that the plank's gonna hit. Now, three minutes, 40 seconds may seem like a long time to you. Me and, me and For me and him, we could do that with 100 pound plates on our back. So we're gonna get you there and we're gonna get you super strong. So let's go check out the plank and let's see how we would coach that. All right, today guys, we're gonna go over right here, we're gonna go over the plank. We're gonna keep it really simple because really it's like, let's get you in the position and, and we'll talk about it. It's really quite straightforward. You know, I think the big misconception is that like this is a real ab dominant exercise. Yes, the abdominals are very much you know involved in stabilizing your thoracic spine, right? And even your lumbar spine, of course. But that's really not what we're looking here. You know, what we're looking is like you look at the length of like where the lat attaches on the human body, right? And where it's here, like it's it's about three quarters the length of your spine. Okay, so that's a big thing. Matt's gonna go ahead and get in his plank position, right? And and I. It's really looking about, we don't want sag, we don't want this to sag. And the way we don't, the, the butt isn't gonna sag if he's lat stable, right? If his glutes are tied in, right? Doesn't have lazy feet, his feet aren't rotated inward and outward. He's creating straight lines that he can stabilize against, right? What do you, what, what do you think about this, Matt, for you? Like as far as your takeaways, like what are you saying like, because I know everyone's driving I say, I say to draw in the stomach like you're going to get punched in the gut. Yep. And then learn how to breathe while staying braced. That's what I like about the plank is that it teaches you to stay tight, but you're not. Yeah. You're, you're learning how to stay tight and still have that cardiorespiratory system. You betcha. Breathing. So yep. I would just talk about drawing in the stomach, squeezing your ass cheeks like it's your first fucking day in prison. Yep. You know, make it funny. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? um, and talking about keeping everything tight. I mean, especially the glutes and the lats. Yeah. So act like you know you're at the mall and you're in eighth grade and you just got done doing a bunch of lat pull downs. You want to you. beat the mall. That's yeah. what I'm saying. And I think there's a lot of things because I will say, hey, squeeze your gl glutes and squeeze your lats, and it's like. I have found that to be a lot of people just, it's not that they don't know the anatomy, they just have never actually made that neural connection. And so mm -hmm. like, so if someone, here's the thing is like on this especially, if someone has a hard time like, hey, flexing the glutes and lats, obviously depending on the client, touch is, touch is super valuable. So if he gets in a plank position, he's got some sag, right? I'm gonna be like, hey man, I'm gonna go and like squeeze your glutes. I'm gonna tell them where to squeeze. I'm gonna physically say, hey man, you're, I'm gonna go around as a coach and go, hey man, lock, lock, lock it in. And that touch, a lot of times will cue the athlete in to go, oh, I just, you know, maybe they may not know anatomy, but from this standpoint, I like it really so much because with that tension, it forces him especially to breathe. I like how he said that, but what I like about the plank most, and I mentioned before, is like, we're talking about really good shoulder health, to be like really good, right? Because we're going the anti-shrub. So if you, if you really, want to, really want to screw somebody up, right, from a physical standpoint, put an extreme load on them and get them into this position. That's exactly why police put you here and lift, right? That's how from, from jujitsu, all these places, we get shoulder control because why? Then we own the hips. Yep. And so that's the big takeaway, guys. Good, stable shoulders by contracting those lats. And the lats are stabilized because we can fire those glutes. Yep. And the big thing is, guys, I mean, the most people think abs, they think six pack, but in reality, it's deeper than that. It's called the TVA, the transverse abdominis. And that's really the muscle that attaches the rib cage along with the lat to the pelvis. When you have a strong TVA, your back's protected, you transfer instead of absorb energy when you run and ruck, and you're also able to withstand heavier vertical loading, which not only would be packs, but squatting, deadlifting, and everything else. If I had to go back and learn from what I know now, I would have had every, in sixth grade, instead of learning how to squat with a bar, I should have been doing planks and all that other kind of stuff because I think what it would have done is teach me how to brace faster and right. bracing is everything. Yeah. Right, that's what you see whether it's, uh, you know, 
you know, we look at everything even dynamic, right? A person can't express themselves with maximal force if they can't brace relative to the force they're going to need to produce, right? And that's why I always say, like, a good piece of advice I got a long time ago is treat your minimum like your max and max like a minimum. And it took me a minute because that particular coach is really talking about movement quality, Mm -hmm. right? And that we talk about the trap bar setup or this, it really comes down to if a person knows what that takeoff is, they know that good position with the pistol is, if they can get in that good squat starting position, it's very likely that they're gonna be able to continue those reps in that position. Well, with the, with the, with the, the plank, there's no real reps. So that's the whole name of the game is bracing. It's, it's everything that we need to do to do all these movements. Well, this particular exercise, that is the do. Yeah, you have to have some static training in your repertoire and you have to be good at it. Static training is probably one of the most underrated things in the world, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do planks all the time to get good at them. I mean, Jeff and I don't do planks that very often. And like I said, him and I can smoke that test with a hundred pound dumbbell or a plate on our back. Why? Because we're doing all the other things we're gonna show you right. So yes, you do need planks and you need to get good at them, especially if you've never done them before and you're just joining the army. But as you get better, the other exercises are really gonna help that without even trying to train. You betcha. you betcha. In reality, in the Army guys, when you guys are training, and we're gonna talk about this more down, down the road on this, in this DVD download, is basically what you guys need to understand is that you need to train things that make everything better. You know, the Army has always been huge, and a huge mistake is you train, you know, you, you get tested in the three mile run or the two mile run, you do the two mile, three mile run all the time. Yeah. You test in the plank, you do planks all the time. That is not the way to get good at stuff. Jeff and I are showing these exercises. We barely do them, but why are we good at them? Because we're good at everything else. So we're gonna show you down the road on how to make these better. So let's go to the next exercise. Another exercise that I really like that they put into the new testing protocol is the med ball throw. Now the med ball throw is a great standard of power. Obviously we would have liked to have seen it a little heavier and not throw for 30 feet. I'd like to see somebody throw a 40 pound thing yeah. and throw it 15, 20 feet. That shows or the real power. It, you know, maybe in the future, but yeah, right. you're right. But they did start off with it going the right direction. But what we would like to do is show you how can you max this test out easily. Well, Jeff's gonna show you a couple of tricks of what he likes to do to throw the medicine ball to make it as far as you can, but also as safe as you can. Right. Yeah, I kind of, this kind of goes back almost to a, like, if it was a dynamic deadlift, right? We've got to, first we've got to do is you have to f- pick a good foot position. And when you're gonna be dynamic, which essentially ends up being a jump, one of the great things to do is just jump. <laughs> go go where the good Lord put you kind of situation. And, or you could step off a bench or whatever that may be. Because that's really what we're gonna do is like, I, I, if I'm too wide to a point, yeah, I might be strong, but I'm not gonna be super explosive. So like what Jeff told you, I'd step up on a bench, you don't even have to be this high, it could be something even this high. Step down and see where your feet like land. There's my jump spot right there. Exactly where he just showed you. So you can do it, that's a little bit more extreme of a height, but yeah, if you just jump up and land, look, and put my feet in the same spot. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is like goes right along with the deadlift is if I need to, basically this exercise is vertical displacement of power. Was it just throw it hard and fast? That's, that's the test, right? So once my foot is in position, okay, if I get over the ball too much, I'm gonna have to like kind of like un- really unfold and I don't want to be doing that either. So <clears throat> I need to just basically, just like the deadlift, I'm gonna go down and create basically a deadlift. And I need to at least accommodate a foot position to where, cause I'm gonna get a little bit lower than I normally would on a deadlift, okay? But from my side position, I don't, I still, I don't wanna jump from here. So right? this, is, I don't what, this is what you're gonna see with most people. Now Jeff's gonna get in right position, you're gonna see him fix it. Look at that, bam. Now the only way you're gonna get that position is training mobility. Cause most people are not that flexible, right? So, it, it, and, and I think that that's also like one of the things here, the takeaway is that these drills done appropriately will improve your mobility. Oh, absolutely. Because like, I go, how do I improve mobility? Should I create this entire section of mobility? No, every rep that you do is your opportunity to express or challenge or improve it. Range of motion. So if you're having issues with the trap bar, use a slight deficit. If you're having trouble with the medicine ball, work on just picking it up correctly the first inch yep. and do you know do four sets of 25 like yep. we talk about winning warm-ups you do four sets of 25 with something in a long range of motion your flexibility you mobility is going to be much better you bet and it's like okay let's say like we really need to get to this and we were like 
we're, you know, if we, had, if we had this on an elevation, like two or three inches, we could get down there. Well, that's perfect. It's like, it's like pulling from a deficit, just like you said. Mm -hmm. We can't, we also can't assume that everyone's gonna just be able to do it. So we have, as good coaches, we need to find ways to accommodate people. So this is, a, if someone doesn't have the mobility, well, I, I don't throw the exercise out. I elevate the ball a little bit. And so that way, you know, if I can learn to take off dynamically here, and I learn it well, well then as I get better, I'll get here, yep. and here, and here, and here, and eventually, work down a half an inch every couple of weeks. That's it. Like, you got and it. that's okay. Like, this, this may not be resolved in one training session, that's why we call it training. That's right. It's always a learning process and we're always still getting better even at 43 years old. So what he's gonna do is he's gonna grab the ball, he's gonna show you how to put the hands in the right position, but see the mobility that, that Jeff has is gonna allow him to throw the ball even farther because in reality, if he can only throw from here because his mobility is so bad. Yep. Think about muscles, right? Right. But now if I stretch, get down in here. Stretch, stretch, stretch. Boom. Right? Yeah. But if I'm only from here, I only got so far to get any power. You bet. I always say, like, if I take my fingers like this and I put a rubber band over it, as long as the position of my fingers hold true and I pull in that rubber band, there's more and more force created in that band. There's more potential for energy release. Yep. That's the same idea. If I hold myself structurally in a good position, I create, it's like a rubber band, I get tighter, tighter, tighter. And as I get tighter, what I, what, if I get tighter while holding position, what I end up getting is more explosive energy coming out the opposite end. Which is also why in professional powerlifting you don't ever see anybody get stable in the bottom. No. Nope. They're always reactive out of the hole. Yep. That's at three quarters of the way up. You bet. So we're going to show you guys the key positions. Now remember, the more mobile you get at this exercise, the farther you're going to throw it and the safer you're going to throw it. Yep. So I treat it like a deadlift. I'm going to step up to the bar, or in this case a ball. I'm going to make sure my, my, my body is going to descend vertically to it instead of get over the ball. So I'll descend to it. And the bottom, I'm gonna actually get pick the ball up and settle. You know, I'm not gonna try to just go right to it and throw. Right? I'm gonna give myself some time to exactly to create tension. And as soon as I create that tension, then it's just a it's vertical displacement. It's just a jump, right? And I'm gonna go up and keep everything vertical. You know, one of the big things with this, just mechanically, a lot of people try to throw, and it's like they're doing a reverse dunk. They're trying to throw it behind them. And I always tell people, my eyes will always follow my hands and so will the object. So when I go to throw, everything goes straight up. Just the same thing we talked about with the trap bar deadlift or any of the other power lifts, you go where your eyes go. And that's the other big thing you guys have to understand. The, the arms are almost a follow through type device. They don't create the power, the hips create the power. And if you over juice, with using your shoulder to try to throw it, you're actually missing the whole point of the drill and you're probably reserving a good yeah. 15, 20 feet of, of distance yeah. based on the fact you missed yeah. your power point. Yeah, this, is, this would be the same what he just said, it would be the same equivalent of like, I'm running and I wanna run faster, so I'm gonna decide to move my arms faster. No, like it all comes down to the feet to express itself and for the upper body to fall in line. Exactly. So we hope this helps you guys throw the medicine ball farther much easier because in our opinion, the, the army test for this is cake. Now this new sled drag medley farmer's walk thing that they got going on, we're gonna show you video of doing it while we're talking about it. There's no sense in us going out in the Ohio weather, which is terrible right now to do this, but we wanna talk you guys through some key stuff. And I think one of the big things is, one, we need to talk about the reverse sled drag and the technique on that. And two, we need to talk about the technique of the farmer's walk with the 40 pound kettlebells. Now for us, we start looking at this going, this is way too light, so we don't need to worry about it. But we understand too that a lot of you guys are just first starting and some of this stuff might be taxing for you. So we wanna make sure you're doing it safely. But this drill was a good drill because they're adding resistance into cardio yep. and that's one big thing that they were missing in the past. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree, that's a big component of it. It's like, yeah, we have the endurance test. But I, but I think that like, especially from a coaching standpoint or like a soldiering standpoint is, you know, we have these like shorter distance endurance pieces, we'll call it the farmer's walk or like the sprint medley, right? It's like, it, 
it exposes, not in a bad way, but like if we took 3,000 soldiers out to go run five miles, like it's hard to assess that. Mm -hmm. Like how is person's running quality in their gait? But we're talk talking, talking sled drag, farmer's walk, and these things in a distance as a coach, we can start seeing these identifiers of not managing ground force, road rolled shoulders, like all these opportunities. And I think that that's a, these are really good because they give these athletic snapshots components. of all the soldiers, kind of how they move. Yeah, it's components. And like I said, I know it's part of that, part of those sprint medleys is lateral. So they're showing some lateral movement drills as well, which is really good. So what we want to do is, I think the best thing that we can do for our time to show you the best is show you some tricks on the farmer's walk to not only make it better, but also show you some tricks on what you should be doing with the sled to lock in, okay? So let's start with the sled. On this guy right here, a couple of high points we're just gonna hit. Um, I, the test is only 90 pounds, right? So depending on the size of the soldier, there's very few things we have to change. Because I would say, let's get in a, a, not a super aggressive backward lean, but we want to favor it. But if we put 90 pounds on there for him, it's just going to fall. So just keep that in mind for some of you. So like heavier sled, a little bit different. But first, this thing is we just don't want to be in a shrug. Like that's the first thing when it comes to a deadlift, like anything is like planks, stay out of this position because the muscles that are going to be driving his spine stability, the lat, when he does a reverse, he does a reverse like lat flexion, right? He's, he's going to shrug, he flexes lats and that creates the stability. But here he's going to have no stability through the shoulders unless he pulls his, his serratus and his lats down and back. Okay, and then right from that position here, guys, we get into a light forward lean. Okay, and we when we when we start moving, okay, make sure we get. Well, big thing is we're pushing off that toe, right? Because what we don't want to do is be our hips sliding when we pull a sled. Okay, so that's the big, really good thing about a sled is that it. We're not trying to do this fast, but we're trying to teach that extension and that managing of ground force and creating ground force in that posterior chain, okay? And that's the big takeaway that I give on this. Yeah, turn it into a posterior leg press. If you turn it into a posterior leg press, the weakest person can move 90 pounds like it's nothing. But if you take two biggest strides and you're trying to focus on the wrong muscles, you're gonna be doing a sway point and you're wasting all this energy when it, all they care about is going in a straight line backwards. Yeah. So the more you get your shoulder weights back, the more you get your chest up, and get your, what I call your lats to your back pockets. It's the easiest way for me to understand it is I'm taking my lat to my back pocket. It's forcing me to go linear backwards. You betcha. And I think starting the process from what he's saying, from the trap down fixes everything down to the foot. Yeah. And then you're gonna be good. Don't take strides that don't feel natural because yeah. longer strides on this is not gonna help. Mm -hmm. You're actually better off finding that medium ground that's best for your leg length and your anthropometrics. Yeah, because like what we're training here essentially if we were, is turnover, right? It's, if he starts off too fast and too strike, all it is is like, because we have a, a given mass and we're gonna have, we have a given distance for the test. Well, mathematically, the, the highest state of acceleration on average is gonna be the best. So it's not a sprint and it's not slow, right? It's, what force or at what speed can you move that to where it doesn't slow down? And if we're looking at the physics, if you get 90 pounds, it's only 90 pounds the first two feet once you get it moving. If you maintain a, a nice steady pressure, you've probably cut that resistance in half. Yeah, yep, for sure. So now you're only pulling 45 pounds once you get it moving. So that means once you get it moving, don't freaking stop. Yeah. And make sure you're pulling it as straight as possible and you're gonna smoke this test like no tomorrow. You bet. The next big exercise that they're going to have in this medley is farmer's carries, and they're using kettlebells, which we both really like a lot. Um, now, using them for farmer's carries at 40 pounds, we don't feel is going to be a huge issue unless you haven't trained a whole lot. And if that's the case, you're probably going to be need to be doing some grip work because your hands, once they fail, it does not matter how good your body is in shape. If you can't hold it, you can't do it. You can't do it, yeah. Right? So make sure that you're training your hands. And remember that kettlebells tend to have a fatter handle than a straight bar. Yep. So just because you deadlift quite a bit, you know, you're, you're dealing with something this big to go to that big, it changes the, the ratio. That's why we sell fat bars on winningstrength.com. Not that you necessarily have to get those, but they would definitely help you tremendously if grip is your issue. Yeah. That's also why we created a grip machine. But there are some key components to physical positioning when doing farmer's walk. It's not only gonna help you breathe better so you're not gassed, but also you're not gonna expend nearly as much physical energy because when they make you do this test, you're gonna have to do it all in one, one rip. So a lot of efficiency in these particular areas are gonna be huge. 
You bet. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. So, like, big thing for me, like, my big takeaway of this, I was like, I see this, and I, I think of a person on a high wire act, a big, long high wire act, like that big, heavy pole. Why do they have that big, heavy pole? They have that big, heavy pole because it forces them to remind them to go arms along, lats engaged. Because if my lats aren't engaged, when I try to walk in a straight line, I have to slide my hips to get my foot in front of it, right? I have to move my hips. But if my lats are long, I can move my body in a nice, graceful position without waddling. So that's the big one, is he's gonna stay as erect as possible. He's not gonna start locomotion until he's in position. So he's really focused on his grip, right? Right, stabilize that grip. I say opposite of a shrug, essentially. Engage those lats and that serratus in the rib cage. And then what, I, what I'm doing is I'm making sure I'm not hitting myself, that they're not moving, right? I'm gonna hold this tricep and, and lat really stable and he's gonna basically glide. He's gonna glide with his friends, like hunting kind of thing. That's what I always tell people is, and if you look at him, his head's not coming up and down. He's not in a waddle. Okay. And that's the big takeaway is, and it's not a matter of how heavy I can go. Like what he's really just trying to do is stay as motionless as possible throughout the movement. And not because what is the, you know, yes, we're going to work on grip, but if he can be like, here's what we see. When I see him walking away, I see a guy with a firearm, right? And I'm watching his back and I'm watching because I don't want my guys like this with a firearm. I want to be gliding, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what this is, is lats engaged and I'm gonna shoot, yep. it's the same thing. And so one of the best things you guys can do when you're holding those kettlebells, at least for me, or if you're a bigger guy, which there's a lot more of them coming in the army now, hold it at a 45. If you hold it here for most people, it's gonna create a little bit more sway. I find that holding it at 45 degrees tends to put me in a very natural position to yeah. carry and makes me have to work way less. Yeah, because if you just stand there kind of naturally, for me in the same way, it's like my palms are turned a certain way, and if I push my hands back, that's, that's what puts me in position. And so that's, it's, and this is a really great exercise because I think, especially as much load carriage, that's why this is so important, not just the shooting aspect, because we think I need to wear something for load carriage. Like and a lot of people wear body armor and they go into that shrug, mm -hmm. right? So if you're really good at being at the anti-shrug, that body arm will not be an issue when you go to draw your weapon or have to handle somebody. And that's the problem. You put, people are always wearing body armor, it creates those stingers like in football. It yep. does, it's terrible. And you go to raise your firearm or go to handle something, like holy crap, my shoulders. And once, once those nerves and the neck is pissed, the rest of the body can be the most fit as possible, but it's- well, that, It not, happened to me, yeah. Yeah, you're not yeah. nearly as efficient. The other big thing you guys have to understand too, is as you go into selection, whether it be seals, but I know this from airborne, is that the guys are carrying upwards of 100 pounds of gear which is why I think they selected the 40 pound kettlebells was because it's about 80 pounds. So if you look at your most elite guys going in with bare minimum, they're gonna have at least 60 pounds of shit on all the way up to 100 plus pounds. If this say you're an army sniper carrying a Barrett 50 cal with some of your some of your ammo and you're having to walk two miles up a mountain yeah. to get in position. Yeah, because a gun alone is 47 pounds unloaded. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So now, I mean, ammo is really the ass kicker. <laughs> this is terrible. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's like you guys got guys clearing mortars and Gustav rounds and all this stuff, these heavy stuff. And it's like we, we have this natural reflex. Go, let's throw body armor and you have to like walk. It's like we've got to condition your spine and your nervous system just to first be okay with carrying load. Yeah. Because and, that, and that's, that, that's the thing is like, it's, it takes a while to get used to body armor. Well, not only that, guys, here's the thing. If you look at any of the Eastern German or Soviet texts, which is some of the only things we can follow because of the tightness mm -hmm. of the data, yep. you have to correct postural deficiencies before spinal loading can occur. Yep. Well, guess what? We're gonna do that ass backwards in the Army because you guys are gonna come in at 19 with no training unless you got this DVD, hopefully, or this download. And the thing of it is, guys, is your spine and your disc take time in order to take that kind of loading. And again, you can have the most fit legs, you could win the Boston Marathon in running. As soon as your back is trashed, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. So make sure you're training the farmer's walk, not only efficiently, like he's telling you, but get fit at it because if you can carry, say, 75 or 100 pound kettlebells for a quarter of a mile, mm -hmm. you go into doing this stuff and it's going to be like cake. Yep. So yeah, we, that's what we do is like, we, we kind of use it as a, 
in between our sets that we use it to create some stress not in the sense of just like we can't not that we can't do in other ways but it's one of those things that you just don't think about i just need to move with quality locomotion when i'm tired mm -hmm. like that you're gonna have to do that even when you're not on target like hey we got a two hour walk in like yeah. that's the thing is like it is it's the most unsexy thing but it's what you do the most yeah so basically we're going to get into this programming to show you guys how to optimize this now the next thing we want to talk about which kind of starts tying into the farmer's walk in this medley is the two mile run. Yeah. Now, I think personally, the stronger you get, the more you're able to run. So running doesn't necessarily opt you to be strength training, but strength training can opt you into being a better you runner. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, I agree. So you need to make sure that the lifting portion, especially if you have say a year or two before you're gonna join the army and or you're going into selection and you got a while, make sure you're getting strong first because strong things don't break. Right, exactly. And that's and I want to kind of put it in this perspective a little bit, like we could use the deadlift or the squat or any exercise, but with reference to running, okay? So, you know, when it, when it comes to running and, and, and weight training, what it is is like, when you have someone run by you, like whether they're running fast or slow, it's, it's hard to see what they're doing mechanically, mm -hmm. right? It's hard to make adjustments to posture and biomechanics when the object is in motion at a pretty high rate of speed or yeah. really tired. And we know from looking at the data that we talked about in the intro of the DVD, running, in my opinion, is causing most of the skeletal muscular injuries in the Army and all of the forces. Okay. So what we need to do is, Jeff is gonna to talk to you about running mechanics and we're gonna slow it all down in a nice pause position to show you what that looks like. And then we're gonna shoot some videos and of various people actually running, doing it right and doing it wrong so that you can see what you should be looking like. Because again, efficiency in running really pisses off drill instructors because if you can run efficiently and everybody else is dogging out and you're not, you're the king dingling when you show up. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. unfortunately, running is gonna be a part of what that needs to be. We wanna make sure you do it safe, effective, and burn the least amount of energy possible. Yeah, and that's also why we're gonna go over, you know, the weight training and things too, because like I said, it's, it's hard to change somebody or give them advice how to change mechanically. And that's why we lift weights, right? is we can do something in a fairly controlled environment in which we can assess the biomechanic nature of it. So that way, if we, if we notice someone has a real issue within a, within a split lunge type position, well, I know that there's gonna be problem when fatigue shows up or that, that turnover that running demands. Mm -hmm. Like, we can address a lot of mechanical issues in a resistance mm -hmm. environment before we go out and just run them to death. And then more importantly, the things that like this, a farmer's carry, a sled drag, that really are transferable to running. So let's talk foot mechanics and running. I think we start with the foot contact. That's gonna be a huge issue for most people. They don't even think about what's going on in their shoe. Right, right. So give us some examples in running of what you think about with your foot in order to be efficient and safe. Yeah, so it goes all the way back. It's like it goes to the warm up, right? You know, we, there's a ton of drills, and I always say when I'm when I work with athletes that need to improve their running, I treat them like a track athlete. I don't just do what the military does and go, well, you need to be a better runner, run more. You need to do better pull-ups, do more pull-ups. Like, no, okay, I we got to treat these individuals individually like athletes. Mm -hmm. And so there's an assessment that goes on to that without getting too deep. But the first thing is, is like. I'm just gonna have my guys jog a little bit to identify a couple things, right? If they're walking towards me and I can film them, I just wanna make sure that I'm not internally rotated too much, first of all, or externally rotated too much. But what we, what we actually see is most people are anteriorly tilted, right? And so the knees are in. I'm internally yeah. rotated. Cold so valgus. I, exactly, I'm valgus. So if I squeeze my glute, you'll see that my humor, my, my femur, excuse me, will contract, it'll rotate outward. Which is no different than what we teach to squat properly. Exactly. So most people, because they're like this, and they walk, their knees are in, and their hands travel in front of them. You just walk, when you're in a, your car, and you're in a nice day, and people are out jogging, Watch, watch where people's arms are at. Most people's arms are here, and if you were to draw, like put like a sticker on their kneecaps, you would see their kneecaps would be doing this as another number, instead of forward and back, forward and back. And that's the thing is like, we're gonna do marching drills, a march. That's the biggest one I can say is a takeaway. Just get in front of a mirror and just see what your gait's at. And most people are like, and then it comes down to what we've just been talking about. If I have a, I don't wanna flex my lats over, right? But my power in my arm, in my repetition of my arm, comes from lats. So what he's doing is telling you guys he's creating a fucking steel yep. rod from his head all the way through his ass. 
And that's creating his ability to not only create force, but doing it in a linear fashion forward versus wasting energy and putting his body in a mechanically poor position that doesn't allow the muscles to even function correctly. That's why it all comes back down to posture. So if you're looking at yourself in the mirror right now, you're gonna look at Jeff, you're gonna see perfect posture. You're gonna see some glutes, you're gonna see everything sitting straight. He's not leaned over with terrible, This, if you see this, you need more than this DVD. You need to, to go see some professional help because this right here, if he's in that poor position, there's no way he can take any kind of spinal loading or any kind of impact of drills without suffering from it way down the road or even, even acutely. Yeah, and that's another reason why we want to do resistance training because like that resistance training creates a lot of neurological stimulus, right? Long-term yeah. neurological stimulus that teaches the body to go, hey, like all this stimulus, but you're not trying to kill yourself. You sure. know, like, there's a stimulus that need you need to place upon yourself that stress and then create an adapt adaptation to it. So give it, us some give us some thought processes on maybe four or five drills that you would tell someone to do to make their running mechanics much better. Yeah, perfect. One of them is already the sled pull, right? Yeah. One is perfectly a sled pull. The second one is the farmer's carry because the farmer's carry gives you basically a reference of your own muscle skeletal system, right? And, and you can do that a lot of times if, if you don't have a, you know, if you have the size of the kettlebell and your treadmill, you can do it on a treadmill. A lot of treadmills have mirrors in front of them, mm -hmm. right? So that's a, so I would definitely do a sled pull hitting those high points we talked about. Farmer's carry is a really good place to do, do that. Also, to, it's, it's like a really good gait warm up because I can walk and go, okay, my gait's good. I can drop the weights. I can walk a little bit faster, go into a jog, right? But I always say run pretty. One of the best ways to run pretty is it's, it's like an A march, okay? This is, this is the big takeaway is I'm gonna pretend there's like a mirror in front of me and I'm gonna start marching in place, making sure my gait is fine. And then I'm gonna put my arms in the right position because we don't want our arms back here, right? We actually want our arms, when our humerus is near our rib cage, we don't go much back further than that. And we wanna hinge at the, at the shoulder and see how vertical I am, right? So I'm gonna get in place, and I'm gonna put my arms in position, right? And then I'm gonna move forward by maintaining a good thoracic spine. I'm not too ribby, right? And I'm not, a lot. here's the thing too is like, I noticed this over the years, some people probably like you, you probably grew up as a chaser. Like you chase people and some people were the chase. Yeah. So it's a weird thing. Most people in the military, they're chasers and we run like we're chasers. Well, we gotta teach these people to run like we're running away from something, oddly enough, right? And that's why we, you're treating this, this A-frame drill, I'm gonna open like this and then I can speed it up and then it becomes a run. And that's one of the big things too, is as, as unsexy it is, but I look at like, if you look at like Usain Bolt and um, Tyson Gay, a lot of really good sprinters from Jamaica, United States, that's what they do. It's track practice. It's not like, all right guys, let's just go run, right? Because exactly what Matt is saying, we have to do these things mechanically, or we should as a coach, because this is how we identify. We identify this person might have knee issues, hip issues, shoulder issues. We do that with these drills. And it's a lot easier to fix something when it's before it's a problem. Yeah. So usually the problem already showed itself. It was just lack of education for what they were seeing. Yeah. So and if you're learning these drills, like what he's trying to teach you, marching in place, getting better at farmer's walk, using the proper resistance training, it, it's, it, it's a 360 degree circle that fixes yeah. everything. Yeah. And that's why you doing them all, it, it, it's, it's a mosaic, guys. And, and yes, we need to do certain exercises over and over and over to create that repetitious nature, but when it, and that's the thing with running is it, it, it seems, and this, I want to take this perspective, it's like if you had a pistol and you have a bunch of people on the range and you have a bunch, everyone's kind of doing their thing, but you have a couple guys down at the end that just keep missing, missing, missing. We know it's a body position issue. It's a technique issue. And how do we fix it? Well, we got to drill. Why what? The basics. And it's so unsexy. And I think that that's the big problem is like if, if I have an, a soldier that can't do this, you know what I know they can't do? Run efficiently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They literally can't have the, like we're trying to do this. And I had like, well, we can't even, can't, can't do it. Get to here, man. If I can get you here, at least you can assess yourself, you know? Exactly. And I think that that's, you know, without opening Pandora's boxes, it is the, it, it is exercises like we've shown done correctly. That's the key. 
to solve a lot of these these postural issues. Yeah, and that's why we're trying to talk to you guys, and I know this is hard for you to understand, but we're trying to talk to you guys, the better at getting it running at first for most of this population today is gonna to be getting stronger first. All of these drills we just showed you that are part of your test anyway, if you get efficient at these and you do them very well and you look like a freaking Terminator doing them yep. as far as strength and mechanics, you're going to run better without even running. Remember, you have to be strong enough to withstand impact. People don't know this, but in a running scenario, you're about two and a half times body weight. Yep. Yep. Well, how many of you guys are comfortable with deadlifting right now, two and a half times body weight or squatting two and a half times yep. body weight? Yep. And I'm gonna tell you 90% of you are not. Yep. So that means that getting stronger is gonna help the run tremendously. But this, that small drill right there is gonna help your running mechanics tremendously. Are there any other small drills that you would like to show to just get better at running without running? Yeah, I think I think the big one is it, it's gonna it would be a it comes from the sled push, but we've got you push instead of pull, right? We see a lot of wall drills, right? We're familiar with having the wall drills to get that 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 force production because I think that's that's what we're talking about is when I see running, there's two things that are really disrupting quality of running. It, it all comes from the ground, right? Does I'm looking at someone's feet. Because that's all that I'm dealing with. If the pe if the person's foot is not handling ground force, what's one of the first things we do? We limit mobility. It creates creates tension in the ankle, and when we don't have the mobility in the ankle. We know we can't produce force. But what happens after every single step? There comes another one, and another one, and another one. And if you got to figure, if if every if there's diminishing effect in a rep to rep to rep to rep to rep. In an environment where we need reps to learn, mm -hmm. what we're doing is if those quality reps continue to diminish, you have taught at the point of greatest duress bad quality and you've reinforced it with the mass. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So again, mechanics, 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 lack of muscle uh, imbalances and also posture efficiency. All of these things corrected are going to help you be an amazing runner without running. <laughs> no, because it's like because I don't run much and I'm a really good runner, but oh. I drill a lot because I coach it and I like doing it. And sure, I, I never thought that. Like I never really thought I could be. An so for all runner. of you guys thinking that you need to run all the time to be a good runner, you just have a SEAL team member tell you that's not the case. So please learn from this video. We are going to get you better at running just by practicing the drills that we just showed you now. Um, I know Jeff has some running mechanics stuff on your website. Yeah, we have like there's there's again when it comes to running, it's really a big sort of Pandora's box, but it, it's not a hard thing to handle if you are willing to do the basics first because that's what the question is going to be is like, hey, my running isn't good, and he and I are going to go, well, what have you done to try to improve it? And now to to people's uh, ignorance and not, well, not yeah, negative, they, they, they may not know. But for someone that's like, yeah, I've been training for a while and I can't drop my run time, and I'm like, well, what have you been doing other than? And we would go, well, it's not, if you're just running, it's like, well, we gotta do the other mechanical drills. Yeah, and usually the answers we hear from people that are trying to get better at running is they're using running to get better at running. Yeah. Which is exactly <laughs> why I tell people, if you wanna get better at straight bar back squatting, don't use a straight bar all the time. Yeah. Because it may not be bringing out your weaknesses or yeah. your mechanical deficiencies. Yep. And it, here's the last thing is like, it's okay to have some deficiencies because what a wonderful thing that we can create this training environment, right? where you can identify your weaknesses, we'll say, or limitations and go, well, if I train them properly in a very short time, that will not be a limitation. Well, and that's another big factor that I think you guys need to consider is that what I like about my system of training, I know your system of training is the same way, is that we're always looking for deficiencies. And see, what we're taught in school is ignore what you suck at and only work on what you're good at. Yep. That is the bad thing to do with your physical body. Amen. So we'll, we'll stop there with the running stuff. And now we're going to get into some other things that are going to be stuff you're probably not going to be able to get away from in special forces, which is traditional sit-ups. Right. Now, the other thing that we're just not going to be able to get away from, I'm glad they flipped the planks because I think they're more transferable, but it's going to be the traditional sit-up. You're going to have some old school drill instructors, guys that are not going to conform to the testing. 
they're going to go back to what they think they know. And we want to show you all of the little intricacies of how to properly do a sit up to a couple things. One, not beat your body up, and two, not screw up your back. That's it. Yeah, that's the big one, right? That's, you know, outside the Army side, right? The, the Navy is still doing sit ups. I believe the Marine Corps is still doing, I mean, the Army does lock behind the head, I believe, in the Marine Corps. So, so it, it, the point is, you're right, it's always changing. So what we'll do is we'll cover the traditional setup because whether we're doing a curl up, a, a crunch, whatever it is, it's we still want to establish the same position and hinge from that same position. Okay, exactly. so we'll just the way that it kind of works in the in the military is like you'll have a person either sit on their feet and in this case I'm gonna have Matt just stand on my toes. Okay, <clears throat> so big takeaway really knees right. I don't want them any really any any tighter than that. I don't want to be super tight. Right, it makes it really hard for your hip flexors. Your psoas and iliacus is shortened, okay? Right, so they're gonna say you gotta keep and maintain about a 90, that's about right. That's where I wanna be. The problem with the sit-up is that I'm already in a seated like flex position. My hip flexors have already shortened, right? Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I go down, the hip flexors, the psoas and iliacus, they lengthen, right? That is when in charge of hip flexion, okay? So as this gets stretched out, Okay, that's the problem. It doesn't actually get a stretch all the way out, right? And that's what makes this sit up so hard is it, I have to eccentrically load kind of dynamically and then change direction with a, with a muscle that doesn't get under full tension. It's like trying to half squat, which is like, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Like when you squat full depth, when you start trying to sissy squat, it's hard to stop in mid range. Sure. So okay. Kind of bench or and that's what's so hard about the sit up is I'm dynamically falling and I'm asking my hip flexors to change direction. Right? Okay, so I'm gonna flip it. I'm gonna tell the guys to get a metronome and then download a free metronome on the phone and put it at whatever sit-ups per minute they want to achieve. Because most people in a sit-up, they come out like, <gasps> and they're gonna eccentrically load dynamically, which eccentric loading dynamically does not really work so good for power management. They tire so fast. So in a sit-up, what I like to do with people is the big thing is I want to maintain vertical posture. If I start curling up, I, I destabilize my legs. Now tell people why they would do that. Why would the natural person even do that? Because what, well, the first of all, their hip flexors are so fatigued that then, then they recall their abdominal wall. Yeah. And then the abdominal wall is tight and then it does not want to elongate. Well, and then the other big thing too is the reason that's a natural position for a lot of people today is because they sit in desks all day. Yeah, right, right, exactly. So they're already in that crushed position. Yeah, so they feel natural there, but it's actually a poor power production piece, 100%. right? 100%. And so from this position, what I want to really want to make sure is that I'm going to flip the cadence speed down just a little bit. I'm going to try to sit up fast and I'm going to manage my descent. So I'm going to maintain a good stable spine and then take my breath and then contract. Create a more, more of a rhythm. Because when I start blowing through it, I'm going to hold my breath. And then I got to stabilize. Then I'm gonna use my rib cage. I'm gonna actually use it. I'm gonna open my ribs, this part of my sit-up, contract it, and carry it into my sit-up, right? If I can, right? If that's an option, right? Now if they don't if they don't want you breaking, then fine. All I have to do is maintain lat stability. If I'm really stacking my spine vertically and not moving my head, to make a letter L, put it on your head, keep this neutral too. If I can get a neutral neck, and I don't do this, I don't elongate some of the muscles that I need to stabilize on a sit-up. So I'm gonna pull my shoulder blades in and down, and, hold, and, then, and I'm gonna hold this position. Right? I'm gonna hold this spinal position and not flex it. So as long as I keep it straight, I can manage force. But if I start going to what he's saying in a seated, right, sort of concave chest position, there, there's just no way to, because then you start seeing people, oh, they fall because the hip flexors are totally shot. The abs get called in and then they just curl you up and then you're, you're super, super shot. So again, he's talking about maintaining thoracic stiffness and tension while yep. doing it in a mechanically efficient position. Yep. And it's, then, and then and be aware, like it's okay to like pace yourself. Yeah. Right. If you, if most people just can set a pace and stick with it, their numbers are going to be substantially higher than like, get out of the gate, 
you get yeah. a minute into it, and then the abs go into a yeah, cramp, this, the hip flexors cramp, and then it's over. This stuff's not a sprint, so what you should try to do is maintain smooth positioning and work your way up from 30 seconds to 45 seconds to a minute. Okay. If you can do it smooth for two minutes, you can you can then start upping the speed. Yeah, and it's a perfect thing is like, when you're doing a sit-up test, so let's say it's two minutes, right? You don't do a two minute test to begin with right. because the test is maintain a state of acceleration. And that's all you're doing to practice it is, well, can I do it for 20 seconds without getting slower? Awesome. Well, can I do that a couple times? Maybe do that three or four times over the week, couple, period of weeks. Then we add some time and we maintain that acceleration for another 15 or 20 seconds and so on and so on. And before you know it, you're like, if you start in a deficit, you taught your body to reflect a deficit, to mm -hmm. get tired, to take a weaker position. It's bad habit, it's posture. You're better off, what he's saying is guys, is you're better off doing three sets of 20 at a good speed with a little bit of rest in between than you are trying to get all 60 in one set. It's just not gonna work that way and you're not gonna see performance enhancement. No, no, because what you've done is, it's such a, it's, it's such a weak spinal position to be already in this preceded position. And it, it's, it, it lends itself to be so inefficient if we, uh, the very, very, very small moment of, of stabilization we can create in this, if we don't stabilize it, you'll never get stability when you move. Sure. And that is so important is recognizing those 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and then accept like, woo, that's, I gotta work on my 40 seconds. Yep. And if you do, you'll just see your time and your numbers improve. Absolutely. So the only other thing we need to cover for you guys now, we've covered the sit up and how to do it more efficiently and get better, I think, is for the old school, is pull ups. Now, pull ups have been kind of been abolished because people are so weak at them, yeah, yeah. you know, naturally, um, that, that they just kind of said, screw it. But guess what? You guys go into selection. You're going to be doing. You're going to be doing pull-ups. Right. So let's go over some pull-up mechanics and some ideas that we have on better. doing better pull-ups. I've done 25 pull-ups at 285 pounds. Yeah. I know you. Yeah, can my, my my best is 36. Yeah, it's a 36. So we know a little bit about pull-ups. So what I want to do is show you guys some key tricks on one how to get pull-ups, and two we got a couple of tricks to show you. If you can't do a pull-up, we got some ways to build up to that pull-up. The other exercise that you guys are not going to get away from, especially with the old school drill sergeants, special forces, etc., is pull-ups. Now, pull-ups are one of those exercises that you're going to have to train to get better at, but you can get better at doing them by getting stronger at rows you if you're not good at it, and we've got some other tips for that. There are two different ways to do pull-ups. There are ways that I do it, and there are ways that Jeff do it. Now, Jeff coming from SEAL team, I want you to try to emulate his form, but I'll show you how I do mine and we'll talk through each one. So, and now, keep it, both of them are right. It's just kind of, we're kind of playing to our body type just a little bit, but that's what we want to show you that because everyone's a little bit different. So me at 275 pounds, I pull it a certain way, but I want you to emulate Jeff. Jeff has a better build to be what you guys want in the military. You're not gonna be going up a mountain too far at 275 pounds. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll grab my hands right outside my shoulders, I'll cross my legs, and then I will start initiate the pull with my lat, keeping my head up and pulling until my chin's slightly above the bar. Notice I'm doing a full range and a full stretch. The key is very little sway, okay? Now, that's how I was able to hit 25 reps at 280 pounds. Now, Jeff's figured out some really cool shit on the pull-ups that I think will help you out tremendously, and I want him to show you his technique because it looks completely different than mine, but it's actually really neat to see. Yeah, a couple things like what Matt wanted to talk to already, like one of the really cool things he already said is variety. And that's the one of the most important things about pull-up, I think, is, is creating grip variety. And that's not looking at this going, that's exactly how our racks, we, I need to make sure that when I get tired here, I can go to here, and then I can even go to a chin up if I want. So to. you notice that when Jeff's going to do his, he's using a two inch wide. I was using a one inch wide bar. Now, why is that important? Well, what if your farmer's walk grip's weak? Yeah. And let me tell you what, strong hands means everything in the military. You can have everything super strong and fit. If you don't have strong hands, if me and Jeff were to go out in the field and wrestle an average person, as soon as one of us gets our hands on them, they're done. Okay. And that's what you want in special ops. That's what you want in general army. Strong hands and strong lower back 
are probably two of the most important muscle groups that you yeah. need. And this, by switching around your grips and having fat handles and things of that nature, is gonna help tremendously. So let's look at Jeff's pull-up style. It's wild. A couple things, guys, I kind of changed because like my I have got long arms for my torso. So I've kind of changed a little bit. I found that when I throw my legs back with such a short torso and long arms, I have a really hard time getting my chin up to the bar. And so what I've done is I've actually found out, and that's because I was my hips were so far because I was really engaged. Well, if I keep my feet out in front of me or below me, my pelvis doesn't pull down so much on my lat and I increase my range of motion. Like this was all for try and error. This wasn't like a study that I did. It's like, I just couldn't get my head, you'll see, up over the bar, okay? So if my feet are out in front of me, right, I could get my hand, my head over the bar. But a lot of guys, they, they take their head to here. For me, with my long arms, I take my head out here a little bit because it keeps my um, lats are more engaged. And so some of that reasoning for Jeff is his humerus length, mm -hmm. elbow to shoulder. Now let's put him his up to mine. Yeah. Look how much longer his arm is yeah. than mine. So that can be the reasoning too why his pull-up positioning may be yeah. a little different. Yeah. So again, base it off of your anthropometrics, but do things efficiently. Yeah, and that's like, I still do the pull-ups the way he does it because that's the variety, the nature of variety too. So. What I want to do is, because like if, like if I go air, if I flex my lats, like air lats, and I see the angle of my humerus, my arms are out in front of me a bit. That's where my body engages the lats the best, right there. And so I'm trying to pull from there instead of being real close where it really creates this, this spinal issue for me. So I'm going to keep my feet out in front of me, and it allows me to, you'll see my body, my whole body like a plank will come into the bar, and then it'll go out and away a bit, okay? It's creating, creating an arch. So I see how much farther he pulls away. And that's making his body efficient to do on pull-ups. Good. So I love that style. There's two different styles. You're probably gonna see most often more like how I do it. That way is fucking awesome. And it's also a great way for you to learn what is your mechanics. Maybe it's something in the middle. Yep. It doesn't matter. But now what we're gonna show you is there's a lot of people that we run into they can't do fucking pull-ups yep. so how do you get to doing pull-ups well one i love doing bent over rows reverse incline dumbbell rows but let's talk more specific and so when we want to train a specific pull-up and we're not strong enough we're going to have bands help us you betcha yeah. one way if you're a bigger guy there's two ways we're going to show you we're going to show you jeff's way and my way to help the one way you can do it is lace, lace it up here somehow you can tie it it doesn't matter then pull this down hook it into your knee, and now I've got probably about 50 pounds less on my body to do pull-ups. And then over time, as I get better, then I can do it without the band. So that's a great way to start building up your reps, especially if you get a lot of, if you're a bigger guy, you're gonna get twisted right here, really bad until you get that, just that development and training, which is probably gonna take anywhere from 10 to 20 weeks just to get the ligament and tendons to start adapting. Yep. Now Jeff's gonna show you another way that you can use bands to help. Yep, and this is, again, it's, it's really six one, half dozen the other kind of thing, you know, because oh, at, yeah, yeah, okay. you know, at the end of the day, it's all we're doing, guys, is we're just trying to find a way to optimize movement. That is, that's really about it. So on this guy, just I'm gonna again, sit, I'm gonna take a minute to set my feet under me, right? I, I don't want my feet to be off to the side. The symmetry is the big thing with this. When you start using the band, right? Get that grip set, right? Right here, it's you gotta kind of time it to where this relieves tension at the finish, right? I don't. I still want to do really want to do the finish work, right? I want to let this accelerate me that will help me get to that finish. Because that's the big thing is sometimes we can do these half reps and sort of things, but if we can just accommodate the reps, mm -hmm. right? What is what does 12 to 15 pull-ups feel like just to even be under uh, have that time under tension? Yeah, you're just having more time under tension. And notice that he has the band set up at the top. It's relieving most of the tension, but it's also not coming off of his foot. 
So it's just in that right sweet spot where it's staying attached to his his shoe, but it's not it's not coming off of his foot where he's like, yeah. shit, I gotta reset my foot. It's it's constant tension, but it's almost nothing at the top. Yeah. If he had it two more clicks down, he would completely release off of his foot, and now he'd be searching for it every rep. You bet. And that's also why I keep my toe into the band, because if my toe is into the band, I know my glutes are on. A good rule of thumb for this probably is if you stand up next to it, the band needs to be a little bit above your knee. If it's a little bit above your knee, it's probably going to be about right based on how tall your rack is. This is an eight footer, which is pretty common. So I would say, you know, walk up to the band and if it's around your knee, it's probably pretty close. You betcha. You if betcha. it's down by your ankle, it's too low. And if it's up here, it's way it's, too high. Yeah, you're helping yourself too much. Now be careful because like I said, with the band hooked into your knee or even having a hook this way, if it comes off, it, it can hit you hard. I've seen guys, you know, hurt their face and all kinds of stuff with these bands just being sloppy. Yeah. So treat this like it's dangerous because it can be. Right, and it's like, it, I always say this like, it's, it, I was kind of trying to correlate this to the tactical world. It's like, yes, we've added band to assist you, but the band is only gonna assist you if you're in the right position. Mm -hmm. Okay, so give yourself that minute to be in the right position. So because if I'm out of position and I throw a band on me, that band is gonna take me even further out of position if I don't maintain stability. Exactly. So there you go, there's pull-ups, guys. All right, guys, so programming anatomy, what we have to decide and what, what he's gonna decide on programming and I'm gonna decide on programming, we're gonna give you a snapshot. First of all, you look at the major injury areas because they are key points and probably lack of proper training in those particular points. Shoulders, why are shoulders an issue? Posture, number one. Number two, usually the tricep isn't strong enough and you have anterior rotation, which is causing rotator cuff, impingement, all kinds of shit. The knee. The knee is usually at a huge risk because the hamstring isn't strong enough and the vastus medialis is garbage. These two areas need to be very strong in order for the knee to track correctly, and not only that, also perform correctly. The lower back. The reason that the lower back is a big issue is because it's a long, thin muscle surrounded in bone and usually fed with a very weak blood supply. So if I were to stab you in the quadricep with a big knife, you're gonna bleed all over the place. If I stab you in the back with a knife, you're not gonna bleed as much because it's surrounded by harder tissue. There's not big vessels there. So the problem with the lower back is a lot of people don't have lactate tolerance in the lower back to be, when it's burning, people fall to the ground and go to the fetal position because they can't get out of pain. Well, if you're training the lower back really hard and really effectively, when we get to the programming, this is gonna be fixed tremendously. Now, the other reason that lower backs are huge issues, which chiropractors and physical therapists are gonna agree, is because we have hip malalignments and muscle imbalances, which are making the lower back work twice as hard. Think of it like driving your car down the highway out of alignment. The tires get chewed up 10 times faster than if everything's working in sync. Here's the problem. I would say 50% being generous, 50% of the people have a leg length discrepancy or some slight amount of scoliosis which makes the lower back even get pissed off faster. Right. Yeah, it's identifying those things. That's why we talk about, you know, as a coach, the biggest thing we provide is that that I, right? And in, in, in what we're that's what we're trying to do is kind of provide you like a, a substitute trained eye in this video for you guys to start identifying these issues so they actually never become issues. Sure. So 66% of your thought process when you're designing your training needs to be in these three areas. And what we're gonna to get to is we're gonna to get to some main exercises that I think you need to have in these particular muscle groups. So the first couple exercises that we're gonna go over are gonna fix the shoulder. So Jeff's gonna be my guinea pig and show you guys how to do these. I'll talk through them while he does them and then he can give you some feedback at the end to show you guys why these things are so important since he's the one with the SEAL team experience. Let's get at it. The first one is the face pull. So we're gonna go over here to the band. Now, keep in mind you can do this with a cable or any attachment that you like. I like bands because it's the hardest at the back part where you're getting the most muscle contraction. So as you can see, he is really pinching all this up. Now you can do this in different positions. You can do it to the chest, which is more like a row. You can do it to the chin, or you can do it to the eyebrow. Another advanced way is over the head. So he can actually pull it above his skull. This actually makes it even worse. So as, uh, the higher you go, the more you're gonna isolate some of these areas. There is no wrong way, but I would say the most of the time for military, I would probably pull it to the eyebrow. 
So the eyebrow face pull is one of my favorite exercises to make sure that you are not gonna have shoulder problems in the future or the present. The next one is the Cuban press. The Cuban press is kind of one of those forgotten exercises that was created a long time ago. This is like a row to a turn, to a straighten out, to a back, to a turn, to a drop. Complicated, but once you do it a couple of times, it's not a big deal. This exercise will really hit the infrasupraspinatus. It really creates a lot of stability in the shoulder. And it's not only a performance exercise, but also an amazing rehab exercise for the upper back. So if you're doing a lot of rucking, or you're doing a lot of running or impactive drills, or you're carrying a lot of equipment like Airborne does, this exercise is bar none one of the best upper body posture assessment movements that you can do. Another more simple exercise that you don't need any equipment for is a basic Superman. Now I like this one because it's teaching you to keep your thoracic spine more upright and also teaching you how to kind of lock in that thoracic spine that we tend to see a lot of people just not have any control over. Right. So he's gonna lay on the ground, pretty simple. He's gonna put his hands out like he's wanting to fly and he's gonna raise up. Now, he's focusing on his upper back but he's also squeezing his glutes, tying in the glutes and starting to gain some neurological proprioception and control in these muscle groups right here. If you talk to anybody that does a lot of rucking, you're gonna notice that that muscle group gets pissed off. This exercise, if you get, say, four sets of 25 every 72 hours or so, you start to develop a base of this movement, you're not only gonna learn how to turn these muscles on, they're not gonna get nearly as pissed under spinal loading. But it's also helping to keep the shoulder. So a lot of times shoulder problems can also come from thoracic spine. Posture issues, this is keeping it like this, keeping it a little bit more like that. Now let's get to some of my ballpark, which is chaotic bench pressing, right? You probably have never seen this exercise if you're not a powerlifter, but in my opinion, if I were to take special forces guys and teach them how to bench press to actually transfer over to shooting mechanics and also shoulder st stabilization, this is bar none the best pressing exercise you can do. So he's gonna lay back, he's gonna put his hands in various positions, remember we talked about variability, right? He's gonna put his feet up like a, like a no foot bench press, He's gonna take it out like he's gonna bench press, and he's gonna take it down and up and try to control it and make it look as smooth as he possibly can. It's down and up. Now, the key with this is do it for time. 45 seconds to a minute are amazing for these sets, and you don't have to start with this level of kettlebell. You could literally start with a PVC pipe and hanging five pound plates. But the key is, is as you notice, that doesn't look any more unstable than doing it with a straight regular bar. That is really, really good. Now he's gonna show you what it's probably gonna look like when you first start this, which is Michael J. Fox eating a sandwich. So you see how unstable that can be. And a lot of that stability is coming up from Jeff's been talking about the whole time, lats. So if his lats are locked in, he's gonna be stable as hell. If he unlocks his lats, he's not gonna look good at all. Yeah. No lats, no stability. Like the big takeaway I would say on this is once you get that un unwrapped, right, don't be in a big hurry to get it down. Like, unwrap it, bring it out over where you're gonna send it from, get stable, and then, then do locomotion. And the next thing too is Jeff, if you noticed when he was keeping this stable, hand strength. So he's squeezing that bar like he's trying to break my fingers the whole time. There is a lot of studies showing that grip tightness is rotator cuff stability. So that means if you're just letting that bar hang in your hand and not squeezing it, your shoulder is less stable than it would be for squeeze your hand. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, from a biomechanic standpoint too, like, right, or shooting, punching, whatever it may be, right, we need to get able to extend a firearm or to create space from somebody, right, and be lat stable, right? That's the big reason from a tactile space is like, I want to be able to get combative with somebody and if I'm gonna get in here with him, I don't wanna be in a shrug, right? It's like an offensive lineman when they're pass blocking. I don't wanna be here, everything is lat stable through the glute. It's very similar. This exercise will really teach you that. In a fairly safe environment, just make sure you wear a mouth guard. <laughs>
that you might need a couple little specialized things, but you could go down to Lowe's and get a $5 PVC pipe. Really, the only thing you really need is bands. You can hang regular plates. You don't need fancy kettlebells, and that will teach you enough in the beginning. Now, as you get stronger, like anything else, you're gonna need more tools in your toolbox. But I wanted to show you guys a little snapshot into some world-class powerlifting stuff that we've seen used in special ops with some great results. The next key area that you need to have major focus on when you're training any lower body is the lower back. Now, we talked a little bit about why the lower back is so important. One, it's most people's weakest link. I know you in selection going through SEAL team and all that stuff, how many people bowed out because their lower back was pissed off or injured? Yeah, I mean, that tends to be like, if something is weak, what gets the abuse is typically the lower back. Sure. And that's, I would say that's probably the majority. Yeah, the big thing we saw in infantry with guys, I would say 25 to 30% of the skeletal muscular bow outs that we had were guys with lower back, lumbar, thoracic, or sacral issues. Yeah, yeah. So this is super important. So whether you're a top brass guy or just coming in, your lower back for physical ability better be on your radar. Yep. So what we're gonna show you is the best exercises that we have found with the most minimal equipment possible to make sure that you guys are focusing on this area and not creating too much right. damage once the impact starts. So the first one is an alternate toe touch. So you're gonna see Jeff's holding this with his right hand and he's gonna go down to his left toe. Now, crossing midline is not only forcing his abdominal midsection to work harder, it's also tying in his hamstring to his lower back. So think of this as a straight-legged deadlift on anabolic steroids. It's amazing. The other thing that it's gonna create is ankle stability. How many people do we know, Jeff, that get cowed out because their ankles get screwed up running too much? <laughs> A lot, right, and as you see the balance, like my lack of balance, like that's it, like that's the key. Like what am, What are you looking for as a, as a consumer, a practitioner, a coach is I wanna be able to do this without a lot of wavering of movement. And so that's, that's what we're seeing. And a lot of times these muscle groups, these small muscles in your ankle and et cetera, are all just need to be at more proprioception. You can control these muscles better, your chances of getting hurt are much less. And all of this is tied into the lower back. Yeah, so what I'm trying to do is maintain a straight line with one of my legs, right? So I'm gonna pitch my right leg and keep, keep it in balance with my torso. And that's, that's the key is trying to create tension and balance and stability and then that, that transfers. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's exercise number one for your arsenals. Not only getting a special ops, you should be doing this even if you're in basic army or just getting into the army. Next one we're gonna show is a banded reverse hyper. This is so you don't have to have a $1,500, $2,000 machine. I'm not saying it works as good, but it's a hell of alternative with minimal budget, minimal time, and minimal ability, right, to set things up. So he's gonna hook this right behind his ankles. He's gonna lock his legs completely straight, drawing in his stomach. He's gonna flex his glutes and lower back, and he's gonna pull his ankles to the ground. Now, depending on your weight, it's gonna be dependent on how much you use. The reason I like band tension in this position is because when his ankles hit the ground, he is at maximum tension in his posterior chain because the band's getting heavier and heavier and heavier. Now, he likes to do it on a physio ball. We'll show that one as well, and that one works really well too. It's more of a stretch. This is more of a contraction. So, neither of them are right or wrong, they're just all different. So let's see the other one that we could do. Now, a similar exercise, it's just in a different position, he's gonna lay over the physio ball and he's gonna raise his legs. So all you need is a bench and a big physio ball. Only thing maybe you might wanna do if we're getting new to this and trying to find balance is maybe we add a little bit of weight on this thing, um, on the bar just to stabilize it, but essentially, I kinda like to get this kinda, on the, make sure I'm on the end, because I really wanna be reached out. I don't wanna be really super short. Um, the big thing is this physio ball needs to be, you can get physio balls that are real, real big. This has just got to be big enough that, or it's got to have enough air in it to when I lay on it, that so my feet aren't touching. That's the, that's because now I can get to full extension and I can actually flex into the ball. That's a key component that most people are not hearing about, flex into, into the, the ball. ball. That's all it's turning on your abs is going to help your sit-ups as well. Yeah, it's going to stabilize the pelvis because it's going to allow the pelvis to go through its range of motion because we get more stability if we allow for it on the ends of our movement, right? Where do I get stable? At the finish. And also at the change of direction. And that's the idea is we want to really finish the movement and use this as a resistance. Mm -hmm. 
That's a great exercise. So I would like this exercise a little bit more for rehab. The one I showed you is a little bit more for muscle building. Yep. Both of these are crucial if you're doing anything with vertical compression because you have to relieve those discs. You betcha. And just you think doing just regular deadlifts and regular squats is gonna make your lower back strong enough. It fixes the muscle problem, it does not fix the mileage problem. You betcha. Yeah, because we, we really, that's the thing is like you mentioned it before is like the lack of blood flow in that region compared to a muscle belly of your quad, right? And that's the name of the game is, we got to create some space, that natural traction that a reverse hyper will give us. And that's what we're doing. We're trying to create that traction. Um, I'm trying to that, create, create that, that, that traction from a contraction. Yep. And decompression. Yeah. So remember, if you guys are out running or rucking, squatting, deadlifting, every one of the programs that Jeff and I do are going to decompress either pre or post compression. And that's where the army is really screwing up right now is they don't have anything as decompressive. Okay. And that's where you're going to have high amounts of muscle building with low amounts of mileage. And this is the exercise to fix it. You bet. Next exercise we're going to show is a basic band pull through. Now you can use a cable with a rope. You can use all kinds of stuff to do it, but we're going to show you with a band because this band costs five bucks. And if you don't have five bucks, we don't know how to help you. So he's going to stand in his natural position, probably where he's going to want to throw that medicine ball, right? So what he's going to do is he's going to let the band pull him through the legs with maintaining a very straight back. Notice he's not rounding his back. Now he's going to stand. Now the advantage to a cable is it stays the same tension all the time. The advantage to the band is he's going to get a little bit more glute work at the top because that's its heaviest position. So what we're doing is we're secondarily hitting the lower back through the glutes. This is really a glute hamstring exercise. But notice that we call the backside of the body a posterior chain. That means all this shit's interconnected. You don't see somebody with developed glutes like what Jeff has and not have a lower back that looks like PVC pipes. Okay? They're all connected. So this is a great exercise to hit you from the back of your knee all the way to the attachment in your thoracic spine. And these are areas you do not want to be weak at. So the other thing we like about this exercise is we're developing a lot of muscle mass without any vertebral spinal vertical compression. So it's pulling us through, but it's not pushing us down. Right. And that's where deadlifting and squats have their limitations. You bet. Right. And it's like, as much as we'd love to say that one exercise can solve all these issues, like that's what we're saying is like, no, is we got to stop like compulsory saying this one thing will fix something or this one thing is the cause. It's, we gotta get past that. Variation is key when training and making sure that you're understanding physics, pressures, gravity, and those things that understanding at a, this a very elementary level can save you years of bullshit, pain medications, and actually just getting out of whatever you gotta do because you're screwed up because you weren't thinking about forces that were being applied to your body on a given basis. You bet. Right. And as, as a leader in our military, whether you're an officer or a senior enlisted, like, I think that that's the, one of the biggest things that we should be offering our, our soldiers, sailors, and Marines and their special forces is like that sense of compassion and go like, well, we didn't have all these available to our military forces years ago, but we do now. So we got to start using them in, instead of just saying like, well, we never had this when, so the guys don't need it. No, we need to leave it way better than we found it. And that, if we have that position, we're going to be able to just make so much more progress in the next 25 years that you didn't have available. My dad and the Marines back in Vietnam didn't have available. That is, that is not an excuse anymore. Yeah. Amen. The next big injury area for most everybody is going to be the knee. Now, why is the knee a problem? Well, I can tell you. One, lackluster development of the VMO. But if you look at both me and Jeff, right here, this muscle is a monster. Look at his, look at mine. Ever had any knee problems? No. Me neither. Ha, huh, interesting. <laughs> now, the next thing is hamstring development. Hamstrings are also a key component for the knee to track correctly and not get hurt. Yeah. Most people that have ACL tears, which is a big one in the, in the Army, I can tell you right now, can't do one glute ham raise or one Nordic curl. Right. Guaranteed. Yep. So that means that the hamstring is knee protection. The VMO is knee protection, and those are two areas in which every test that we just showed you is not really attacking and isolating. That means that to perform these tests and not get hurt, we need to have these muscle groups in mind. One of the first exercises that's the simplest to do is a seated banded hamstring curl. So let's show that. So we're gonna back away the band enough to where we got tension at the very end of the movement or legs fully extended. And then what he's gonna do is he's just gonna flex it into his ass. 
trying to keep his knee as flat as he can, not pulling up and using too much hip flexor, just like that. Now, a lot of times with this amount of band tension, we'd use this as a warm up before we would do a deadlift. I would even suggest doing this before you run um, or anything yep. high impact jumping. Yep. This will help tremendously to keep your knee healthy. Now, what's a good rep range for this? I would say somewhere around 15 to 25. Why? Hamstrings need endurance as much as they need strength. We're getting all this strong by doing a lot of trap bar deadlifts, so I would keep my rep ranges on a lot of these exercises we showed you very high for lactic threshold. Because once your hamstrings start burning to pieces, yep. again, it doesn't matter what the rest of your body can do. If your hamstring's pissed, you're pissed. Yeah, and I can't, I can't emphasize it more what Matt has already said, and, and it don't, I don't want you to miss it, is like, are we ever gonna be able to remove the mileage necessary from our military forces? No. Um, and we're talking about training, but all that being said is like, we need healthy knees. Like the hamstrings are probably the most overlooked body part, probably I would say, um, as, a, as, a, as a major functioning body part that is so crucial for health. Like if you want longevity, if you want to manage ground force, you want to be a high performer, the hamstrings, like that tracks your knee and your hip even so much so good. Well, not even that. Most people confuse tight hamstrings and they don't realize that their hamstring's tight because it's weak. Yeah. So I have never seen a tight hamstring that was tight because it was too strong. Right. Usually it's tight because it has no strength. Right. And muscles like to utilize tension in order to beat strength, yeah. meaning a tight muscle is a weak muscle. You get that muscle stronger, it will loosen itself up. Tons, yes. So remember, if you guys got tight hamstrings, which is gonna be a lot of you guys watching this video, it might be, or it probably is, because your hamstring's weak. Yeah. So the next exercise Jeff's gonna show you is a VMO raise. This is a very simple exercise that therapist has been using for years. So he's gonna go a long ways on the bench, sitting up. He is going to put one foot up on the bench, tucked. He's gonna take the other foot out straight. Now you can do it laying down like Jeff shows you, or you can do it sitting up, it doesn't matter. So he's gonna get, have his leg completely straight, the one. He's gonna turn his toe to 45 degrees, and he's gonna lift and hold. So he's gonna lift it up, hold for 30 seconds. This looks like nothing, but I'm telling you right now, this exercise is full blown, insanely hard, especially if you use any kind of ankle weights. Now, a good rep range for this is three sets of 30 seconds. If the Army were to listen to what Jeff and I are having to say, I would do this three sets of 30 seconds each leg before I did any kind of running. And that would track your knee patella yeah. a lot better and cause knee inflammation to go down probably half. Yep. Right. Because, and then again, like, what, it's interesting in the words we use. Like, we're, Matt and I are saying, hey, these are exercises you use. Well, we could also use them in a rehab setting as an identifier of a potential injury. Yep. Right. So, like, when people go, um, you know, how do I figure this stuff out, this, that? And now I always say, you should always be in a position to to manage what you're doing like always be in a state of assessment and like that's what this comes down to guys like we're not just saying hey do these exercises be be present with them right we don't go to the range with 15 rounds on our pistol just point it down range look away pull the trigger 15 times and then go yep i've got my i did it i did my 15 rounds like no 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 like be mindful be aware be present in, in that that's I think is training a needs to be just as cognitive as it is a physical attribute. You yeah. need to be thinking about what you're doing at all times. That looks like a simplistic exercise, but if it saves you from an ACL tear, a knee rupture, or allows you to train harder, who's the one with the with the ball in their court? Right. right. And it's right. a really cool thing too. Is like you'll see just from what you've been exposed to in life. Let's say we do this my other side. My right side is way easier makes sense and now I go okay well when I'm running and I know this because of all the trauma all the trauma I've had in my life has always been on my left side my broken ankles my torn ligaments everything and so I know my left side is deficient so now I have something to key into all the time knowing that the rest of my life that like well I did all these great things I did all these amazing things or whatever like I got an opportunity to do well there were stress and tension and pressure and sport and it created me Yep. And so now I constantly have to assess myself to make sure I don't regress. And that's what, that's what we're doing is yep. these exercises aren't just, oh, get better. It's like, I got to see if I'm put together. Well, and he, what he's talking about is isolateral imbalance, which we're going to get to in, in the training methodology. Everyone has left and right imbalances. And the more you get those close to equal, 
your injury rate goes down, I'm going to say half. Yeah, big time. So left to right imbalances are huge, and they're present in everyone. Especially in anything that it didn't, is it has a necessity of endurance, which is like everything in sport and military, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we hope this helped you guys create a philosophy. Now let's go over a training block and show you how Jeff and I would lay out our week and rotate our weeks to make sure that you guys are getting the optimal amount of training and making sure that your muscles are not only getting stimulation at the right time, but also recovering, which nobody thinks about. Right. Yeah. Let's do that. All right, guys, so maximal strength is the key to programming theory and design. Strong things don't break and strong things can take impact. So what we have to do is we have to design our strength training program based around maximal strength and some of its components. What are its components? Well, one, we have obviously maximal strength. That's one RM strength. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we train at that. It means it's a component to find out where we go for other things. So we have absolute strength, okay, which is what we just said, which is kind of like maximum strength. Then we have like strength speed and some of its components. And I like to use strength speed because in my opinion, speed strength, which are two very close and similar, has a little bit more of a strength component. Really, when you say speed strength in front of that, just means more explosive. So speed strength is more kind of like weighted plyometrics, and strength speed is more like using weights to get faster, like dynamic squats, mm -hmm. right? Then we have explosiveness. Now, the big thing with this, guys, is that you need all of this to start creating what we call anaerobic endurance. Anaerobic endurance is key to everything. What does anaerobic endurance mean? Anaerobic means can you do something hard for a long time, yep. not something easy. Okay, like me and Jeff will tell you, running is easy. Running with 100 pounds of shit on your body is <laughs> fucking hard. So you have to have anaerobic endurance in order to explode that and make sure. But the only way you can have that is to have this. And so that means we have to have that. Why also is maximal strength important? It's what most people lack. Yeah. So I would say on a given day, if we were to walk into a military base, we would be, not with mechanics of course, right. we would be more impressed with how far someone can run than how much someone can deadlift on right. average. Right, that would probably be the thing you could look for, right? And I want to say like, when it comes to maximal strength, if this makes, it's relative, right? It's, it's not like, hey, you have to squat as much as Matt can. To, to, to express what maximal strength does. What, because we're trying to get an adaptation, right? We're just using terms to do that. So, right, once we create that baseline of maximal strength, all that says is like, it's like a mortar. Like, a mortar is not good without the base, right? It, with all that power, with all that force, if you don't have something to stabilize it, well, then you're just gonna lose it as soon as you, as soon as you try to create it. Yeah, that's right. So, and then it comes like with the strength speed, it's like if you, you know, absolute strength in terms of the, the object in motion is pretty slow, right? But when you start getting into strength speed, that object in motion is quicker, right? And so you produce more force. But if you use, too, the weight is too heavy, right? You can't produce the force and you're not actually getting the adaptation. So we wanna make sure that you're in position, your position is there. So you can express maximal strength, maximal speed, and then, then endurance as well. So by having that, we know that we need a component for maximal strength to increase in order for us to increase anaerobic endurance, which is going to make even normal endurance take. Right. Okay? But we have to be strong enough in order to do that. Now, all the components that we just talked about in the previous chapter was basically to get you prepared to do this kind of stuff. Yeah. If your knees aren't balanced, your hamstrings aren't strong, you don't have a good core, you don't have balanced shoulders and your posture's not any good, you're gonna be very limited on the exercises that you can use. And I just wanna make sure that you get that out of the way. Now, if you need help with this, Jeff and I both do a lot of online coaching and that would be a huge factor because in this video, we cannot go over all the factors of what it's gonna to take to write a good program. We're giving you a really good snapshot of what we feel is the most important, okay? So, with that being said, now we know we need maximal strength. The next thing that nobody thinks about is recovery. So, we can only do what we 
can recover from, I believe is what you're gonna write, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, like you, <laughs> if you have five gallons, you can't put six gallons of water in. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about this in the Q&A when we get done with this, which is basically, this comes down to sleep and nutrition. You can only use a proper program if you got your hydration, nutrition, and recovery dialed. You know what the biggest thing I tell people on my YouTube channel, and he's told people for years, we've been doing this about the same amount of time, is that you need to be focusing on recovery and performance follows, not the other way around. If you think that you can ignore recovery and performance goes up, you're lying to yourself. Especially when, like say for instance me, right? My goal was to be as strong as I possibly could be in powerlifting. That's a singular goal. As a special ops unit guy or something of that nature, you gotta be strong, have endurance, and have high skill. Those are three things that don't necessarily like to coincide with each other. <laughs> no, they don't. And they have to be very, very skillfully placed yeah. in order to train properly. Yeah. And it's preparation, the way that we practice, the way we train those things. Like that, that's that's that is the important thing because we're all trying to get you guys as advanced as possible. Right, and because that's what we talk about. We talk about the PRs, we talk about our best list, we talk about all those sort of things, but it, it, I think maybe that's our, our way of trying to make the process as sexy as possible because the process is really what created you as an athlete and created me as an athlete and coach. It's like, I just, we would love to give you that. Like, is everyone gonna have the passion? No. And, and, and no, not everyone has to understand all this, but if you understand a piece of it and you approach it the way we're asking and move well, and choose good rep range, then you have a range to practice and you'll figure it out. So we're gonna go over some key components that I think you need to at least have a basic understanding on to make a good program. And then we're, gonna get, we're just gonna to cut to the chase and give you what we feel is a designed, really good two week cycle that I think would work for nearly everybody without basically being able to personally see you. Yeah. Okay, so the next big factor we have is everything falls along the line of the circle, okay? So we have max effort. So we just talked about that, right? And the reason that we're harping on it so bad is because we both know that's most people's weaknesses. The next thing we have is dynamic effort, okay? Now dynamic effort is sub-maximal weight and maximum velocity. Mm -hmm. So that means moving, let's say you can bench 250. Now you only put 100 pounds on the bar and you blast it as fast as you can. That's the dynamic effort method. And then we have the repetition method. Okay, the repetition method is sub-maximal weights again under fatigue, right. meaning you might go to close to or at failure. Yeah. So this one is designed for hypertrophy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, learn under duress, like that's a real good thing. It's like how do we set base for these things? The reps give us the base to create the stress that allows for max effort and dynamic work. Because there's one thing that the repetition method have above the others creates ligament, tendon, and bone density because of time under tension. Exactly. That means it needs to be an integral part. But remember what we just talked about, the three major areas of injury, shoulder, low back, and knee. So we already showed you all the muscle groups that I feel the repetition method needs the most work. Hamstrings, low back, abdominals, upper back, all of those areas need to have hypertrophy in mind. Why? They're structurally sound and protect joints. Yes. So we don't just train like a bodybuilder, a muscle and fitness or a Joe Weider magazine. We need to train with purpose and that purpose should be following our weakest links and our injury data. Knees, right. lower back, shoulders. I'm going to drill this into your head as long as it takes. The maximum effort method creates the greatest gains in strength. Okay, now we know that strength is the key component to make everything else work. The problem is if we use it too much, we will burn out the central nervous system and we will actually regress rather than progress. Okay. This is, becomes very difficult and why we're gonna lay out a solid two week cycle for you guys to take a look at so you understand that you can't use it all the time. And yeah, that's again, lifting too heavy too often is not beneficial. Right, lifting constantly doing the repetition mesh of the bodybuilder, you've got to change those stimulus, right? The dynamic effort method is for power. 
And power creates a time component, meaning it doesn't matter if you can squat 700 if it takes you 20 seconds to do it. That's not going to work really well for a tactical athlete. What we need to be able to do is do something in a moderate range and very, very explosive. Yep, exactly. So we need power, right? Rate of force. Yeah, Dr. Hatfield, the late Dr. Hatfield, right? His, I believe his research was saying somewhere between 22 to 27 percent. Rel, but it's relative. Like his percentage for for dynamic effort would probably be higher than mine because of his absolute strength component, right? It's it, that's where you start seeing is like that's what I mean by it's relative. It's like relative to me, I can do all these things dynamically, max effort, repetition. I'm not comparing myself. But here's the thing. If I can bench press 350, I can use a bigger percentage of a speed work than, say, Jeff, if yep. he can only bench 250. He's got to use 30% yep. or 40%, right? So the point is, is that as your maximal strength rises, so does your ability to create power with a heavier load. So now you understand why you need to be stronger. Also, the maximum effort method has motor, higher motor unit recruitment than all the other ones unless you get highly, highly skilled, and then you can actually create the same amount of motor unit recruitment with the dynamic effort method as you get better. So what I'm saying is, guys, is that you need 33% of your thought process in getting hypertrophy in functional areas. You need 33% of your thought process in getting faster with a submaximal weight, and you need 33% of your thought process getting stronger so that all of this other shit can shine. If you just try to work on bodybuilding, your maximal strength will not rise. If you just work on maximal strength, you will not create functional hypertrophy. If you just work on functional hypertrophy, you won't necessarily get faster. Do we understand why you need all three methods at least employed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, exactly. If you understand this, which we tried to make it as dumb as possible, you understand more than 90% of strength coaches. Yeah. Okay. So I want you guys to understand how important this is and why. Now, which one's more important? Neither and sometimes only one. Why? Which one is my weakness? Mm -hmm. So if I am naturally explosive but weak, maximum effort method is going to help. If I've naturally got a lot of muscle mass, like your mesomorph, mm -hmm. but I don't have a lot of speed, I need to be focused on the dynamic effort method. So basically, measure what you think you're the best at and avoid that more and start training your weaknesses. Why do people avoid training smart? Because it brings about their shortcomings. Yep. Yep. And that's the PST, guys. It's a physical test. So that test gives you results. You do a test. You do X number of push-ups, that's result. And as a coach, we go, hey, he got 45 push-ups. We go, where is he lacking? Is it an endurance issue? Is it a strength issue? That's, that's why we do testing. The testing determines the lack of function or the, the function that exists. And then we, we, sometimes the test isn't, isn't super complete. We go, well, let's do this. Let's do a 300-meter shuttle or let's do one of these exercises. They become an additional test because the PST isn't, isn't encompassing enough to train. It's right. not encompassing enough to develop, which is why I don't even train for the PST. I train the athlete, the soldier, and then the PST is, is, the is PS, what The PST is a cakewalk. Yeah. It's just like for us, when we train for powerlifting meets, going to the meet was cake because you don't doing, work. doing 1,100 pounds for a double was a lot harder than squatting 1,165 for one. Right. The same thing should apply to your yeah. PST. So what we really want to drill into you guys, especially you officers, don't train for the test, make the test a cakewalk. And then you won't have to worry about it at all. And in my personal opinion, the test really isn't that hard. Making them better and teaching them this kind of stuff is gonna change their way of life. It's gonna make them last longer, they're gonna age slower, they're gonna have more resiliency on the battlefield, and they're actually gonna be usable on the combat zone. Training for a PST will shorten your career. Training this way will create longevity, and it will also drop your injury rate to the point where like, I've, I've fallen and crashed and been in some pretty hairy situations and I've walked away from 11 years with more than a dozen combat deployments and I basically walked away with all those over a thousand missions, hundreds of skydives and I have a fractured ankle and two torn ligaments in my left ankle to show for it. I broke one bone in my hand and I, and I man, I've, I've crashed, I've fallen, I've been blown up so many times off ladders, like I mean high falls and I was like, I don't know how I walked away. I've, you know, our ladders would go up to 27 to 30 feet, some of them, and I've with the RPGs been blown off of them onto a, onto a road. And they're like, 
Like, how the hell did I not break? Yeah, and we've had Ranger Regiment, when I was working with them from 06 to 09, guys coming back from deployments in tears going, if I wasn't strong enough, I wouldn't be standing here, I'd be dead. So strength will help you survive. 100%. It will help you fa survive impacts from falling, 100%. all this stuff, guys, and we just cannot drill this in enough. So now let's show you how we would lay out a two-week cycle of undulating conjugate which I believe has never been applied to the military. <laughs> you and I are the only two I know doing it. Dude, I honestly, I honestly have been experimenting with this in my head the last couple of years and have never shown it to anybody. So we're excited to show it to you on this DVD. All right, homies, we're gonna give you guys some advanced stuff on how to train. Now, we're gonna show you guys sample workouts so you can freeze this download and look at those as well. But I wanna give you guys some intake on what week one would look like if you had two of the best program designers, an ex-Navy SEAL guy, conditioning guy, to put together a program, what would it look like, and how would we design it for anybody starting off all the way to the best? And then we're gonna show you. Well, week one, we're gonna undulate into max effort. Undulation means not using the same thing all the time. So we're gonna use maximum effort this method, because remember how important we talked about, right? It's super important, it's the basis of everything. So on day one for max effort lower, we wanna to try to keep the workout around 50 to 60 minutes. All resistance training, especially for tactical, needs to stay in this range. Why? Because it will force you to be able to recover. Remember, we have to do some more running and some other things. If you're lifting for two and a half hours, one, you're wasting a shitload of time, and two, you're overtraining yourself to death. Remember, you can't do what you can't recover from. The warm-up, we're gonna base it on a winning warm-up, which is what I've designed for maximal GPP and hypertrophy in the specific areas in which we need, lower back, shoulders, and knees. So today is a lower day, we're gonna focus on lower back and knee. So a hamstring, a movement pattern, and a core movement. We do this in a circuit in 12 to 14 minutes, 300 reps in 12 to 14 minutes. If you don't get in shape on that, I don't know what makes you in shape. Then you have a main lift, which is what the max effort work is all about. It's a deadlift or squat variation, and it's designed to develop strength. You can select anywhere from a one rep to a five rep max. If you go above five, it's not really strength anymore. It's more in the hypertrophy range. For me, I personally believe for tactical, you need to stay about 80% of the year between threes and fives, because it's right in that line of strength and functional muscle mass. Most of you guys are not skilled enough to use one rep maxes on a consistent basis and see any results or strong enough. Agreed, yeah. I only use one rep maxes about 10% of the year and I'm a professional lifter with a 600 pound bench, if that gives you an inclination. Do you have anything to say about that? No, I just like that, especially that last piece you said because like if, if, if you're basing your percentages off something that can't even be repeated, right? Because when you're dealing with like a, a, a true maximal effort, right? That why I don't do up one around because now I have to base my entire program off of that day that was either a great day, a moderate day, or it was a terrible day. So what Jeff is explaining to you and the Russians figured out long ago and why they flipped their advanced athletes to RPE, rate of perceived exertion, is because your maximum effort strength can fluctuate up to 10% from day to day. That means today Jeff could bench 400 and tomorrow he benches 360 for no reason. So it's hard to base it off of a true one rep max. Mm -hmm. You want to rotate your exercises and make sure you're basing it on threes and fives. Therefore, you reduce the amount of anxiety created yes. in maximal efforts. Yep. Yep. Now, I'm the same way. It's fives. You have threes exactly. and fives. Exactly. So now you get that main lift out of the way. You're seeing example exercises. The next one is accessories. We pick three exercises very similar to the warm up but now we're going to do one minute sets. Why do I like one minute sets with tactical? anaerobic conditioning and GPP, lactic acid tolerance. You gotta be able to keep working with finesse when shit's burning off the bone. One minute sets will do that. Cause trust me, in about 40 seconds, you're gonna wanna stop. And now you gotta dig through the other 20 seconds. Those exercises are selected based on your weakest links. So a lot of lower back, a lot of hamstrings, and a lot of core movements are gonna be utilized in your accessories. Remember, we want to get it done in this time frame, which means there is not a lot of bullshitting or going on. Now, we rest a little while, maybe a day or two, or we throw in one of the conditioning days, and now we're at day two of lifting, and it's maximum effort upper. Now, most of you guys are going to get better at doing push-ups and bodyweight stuff if your maximal strength is raised. For example, if I'm a 200-pound man with a 400-pound bench, I'm twice as strong as I am heavy. 
So how many push-ups do you think I can do? Versus if I can only bench 225 and I weigh 200, guaranteed you're not doing 62 push-ups. You bet. So amazing maximal strength is key because it allows sub-maximal weights to become easier. So three exercises again based on triceps, upper back, and a movement pattern. Most of the time, because you guys want to get better at push-ups, it needs to be some sort of a bench press, either on a slight incline, flat, or decline. Remember, rotate movements, and we're going to show exercises on that. Four sets of 25 in that same 12 to 14 minute range to increase GPP, lactate threshold. We rest a couple of minutes. Main lift is some sort of a max press movement, a military press, an incline, a decline. It doesn't matter. It just needs to be rotated whatever you have available, which for some is gonna be a lot and others not so much. That's for strength, and again, three to five rep range to develop functional hypertrophy, muscle mass, tent, ligament, and tendon density, because we don't have that one rep max strength all the time. Only test it, I would say at most, every 12 to 15 weeks. Now, accessories are the same, three exercises, one minute sets and circuits, GPP and lactate. Those are gonna be based on triceps and upper back. What did we talk about with getting better at the upper body movements? Lats and tries. Well, guess what? It raises your maximum bench the same rate. So fixing weaknesses and getting stronger are equal if you're training correctly, okay? Now, the third day is gonna be probably about 72 hours away from day one, which means one of these days that Jeff's gonna talk about here in a second needs to be in between. Day three is based solely on the repetition effort method and it's gonna be based on lower body exercises such as kettlebell swings, alternate toe touches, band crunches, something that's attacking all weaknesses. So for most of us, without seeing you, I'm imagining your glutes, your hamstrings, and your abs are probably needing more work for you to see better potential and less injury. That means that is dialed into that. Now, obviously this is just the, the skeleton we're gonna show workouts that you can pause and see. Now we're gonna to get to the stuff that everybody thinks is all tactical <laughs> and probably should be thinking of on the back burner, which is the conditioning. Now, Jeff is gonna show you how would you do this as a progressing Navy SEAL. So we're starting this off as we know that you guys might be beginners, but this would still be the same if you were a SEAL team guy, it'd just be maybe longer, faster tempo, or a little harder. Remember that on max effort week, you are going to focus more on longer style cardio training versus high intensity training because you've already wasted your motor units. Yep. We're gonna show you the next week, which is dynamic effort method, where the cardio is enhanced because the lifting isn't as maximal. Right. So go ahead and talk about conditioning. Yeah, on this one, guys, I get just there, there is some method to my madness here because what you're kind of seeing here, I don't want you to get too wrapped up in like, hey, I have to follow these percentages. Okay, but what a percentage is giving you is, is basically giving you guidance. Like when you go to the eye doctor and they sit you down, they're trying to find the right lenses. They're like, hey, is it better or worse? No different. And that's what we're looking for, these percentages, okay? And these are perceived percentages, okay? What we're gonna do here is, especially like if we really need to improve running, what does running do? Like what, what I'm, instead of running improvement, what I'm looking to do is I'm trying to improve my aerobic base. Uh, and when I also improve my aerobic base, what I do is I shorten my rest periods, right? When I have ability to transport oxygen to and from my muscles very efficiently, I, my recovery rate's much slower. So what, we have three energy systems, and we've all experienced this. We've gone and laced our shoes up and gone for a run, and we're, you know, you get running, and there's no pressure, maybe not in a selection environment. After like seven, 10 minutes, you get this like second wind, and you feel like you can just keep going. What you're experiencing is your body's energy system converting into oxidative. Right, we, that's what we want for all of you. So that way, your oxygen is being used as energy system, and you can get you can get after it. And so, it takes a little while for the body to get in to be to utilize that energy system. And that's what you're seeing here. Because I'm going to have you run three minutes at a jog at 60% of perceived effort, just to begin like getting. It's also a bit of a warm up. We'll say now. Before you do this, I would suggest you have done a warm up, done a stretch, maybe do some drill work, right? To to begin to uh, to establish your your movement principles. Okay, I'm gonna have you walk for a minute. Okay, and I'm gonna have you jog for 30 minutes. Or I'm sorry, jog for three minutes at 80% perceived effort. Now we're gonna we're basically see we're increasing the intensity to tell the body, hey, we need to convert to oxygen. Get right, and then we're gonna have you walk again. 
And then we're gonna have you throw on 30 pound ruck. 30 minutes, you're gonna walk as fast as possible without running, okay? Why are we doing this, right? Our goal is to improve your running, right? Like, why isn't he running? Why doesn't he want me to run? Because we're substituting, right, from a standpoint of physics, I know Matt has talked about this before, force equals mass times acceleration, right? Granted, that's two-dimensional, but it still works for forward movement, okay? So what I'm having you guys do is substitute, right? I'm gonna have you walk a little bit faster, okay? Because we're substituting acceleration to mass. That's all we're doing to increase the force component, okay? And I don't want you to run, I want you to walk as fast as possible because what rucking does really good is because I've added mass, now I've got acceleration moving linearly, but what I'm still having to do is manage ground force at a higher rate without me having to run, like creating that complexity of the energy. Like we're getting the ground force because we're adding 30 pounds, I'm walking as fast as possible. Now we're getting better ankle mobility, okay? Because we're, we're actually with a ruck, we're actually able to get the ankle to roll all the way through, right? And if we're out of position, we can really gain position much better for a ruck and get that quality of gait under fatigue, okay? And that's gonna drive the heart rate up and all those good things. So. That's one of the things, another option is, well, we can have you rock at 25% of your body weight, okay? So we're making to make it relative to everyone. So we're gonna put you on an incline, like a treadmill, for example. And this is gonna be pretty difficult. 25 minutes, don't run, okay? And all you're trying to do with that additional 25% of body weight, your goal is for the time in which you're moving, okay, to not have your acceleration drop. That's the goal, right? And if you're able to do that, it's not a point of judgment like, oh, I should be able to do it faster. You'll be able to do it faster if you can make a decision to do it. Like if you can make a conscious decision to do it and you're able to do it, now your body can make an adaptation to it. You can't be like, I've heard so many times, well, you know, I'll never quit. But it's like, yes, but if you can't actually do the skill, you'll get pushed out of selection. So we actually need you guys to do the skill, okay? So that is the big thing with, with why I have guys do, we'll do running too, but rucking is a really go-between because you guys have to carry weight anyway. And it's, again, I really, really like it for ground force management, like really good for the ankles, really good for the feet. I mean, it's an opportunity to see it because it's not at a high velocity. This is a great ideal, guys. Like I said, you're seeing programming from two separate ends of the spectrum that have both learned from each other for a long time. Now, what we're gonna show you is the secret of when would you put these days? Because we have day one, day five. So let's talk to Jeff, since he is the expert on this, which days would you put these types of workouts? We have five days. We definitely need two days off for restoration, which we're gonna talk about later. Right. Where would you put these days? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't put these days necessarily, these days necessarily back to back to back. I'd create separation, right? So we want to do max effort? Yes, I would definitely, at the beginning of the week, we call it doing max effort because it, for your nervous system, right? Let's, let's, let's put the screws in the nervous system day one. That's right. what I say. Tuesday? Um, after that, depending on the lift, right? If it's a lower body, what we might be changing. But for this case, I, personally, I would just drop day four, that, this, this day into there. Right? Yep. And then I'd probably go max effort upper on Wednesday. Yep. Okay. Now you notice the spacing, guys. Yep. We're trying to hit different energy systems, different types of muscle contractions. Remember, the body just hates specifics. If you're trying to do the same thing over and over again, it's going to wear you out really fast, especially neurologically. Yeah. So understanding where to put these days is very important. Yep. Thursday, because we've trained three max days in a row, I would probably have Thursday as my day off. Same. You really can't train more than two or three days in a row. And that's if you're training very differently. Yep. So this day needs to be an off day for restoration. Agreed. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing nothing. You could be doing a brisk walk. You could be going to get a massage. You could be doing anything you could possibly do for recovery. We'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. But the point is, is we need a day to restore. This is when the body's adapting. You don't adapt when you train, you adapt when you recover. Now, now we can throw in which day would we like here, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, I would do another, well, actually, let's let's go with the run day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're doing another run day. Now, Saturday, we'll probably do our RE day, yep. day three. And then this would be our next day off. Now, look, what we did was, is we put this day off because Monday, 
we're going to smash legs yep. again. Yep. So if we've selected this style, which I would say would be the most beneficial, now the next week, which we're going to show real fast, is this is going to be dynamics, this is going to be dynamics, and because they're not maximal tension, they're sub-maximal weights, we are going to up the conditioning days. Mm -hmm. Now, notice we're doing conditioning with, with winning warm-ups, we're doing conditioning and lactate threshold with accessories, mm -hmm. and now we're putting in specificity with our military training. Exactly. This is the yeah. best of all worlds, guys. Yeah, and we'll show that too, because like we, we, you gotta see that the, the, well, the resistance, we're hoping to see is the resistance training you're seeing on this end reflects similarly the energy systems here. Like right? we were saying, the next week would be a power module, essentially, right? And potentially an absolute power. And the running would also reflect that. So we would get to like, be more like track work, be running sprint work, 100s, 200s, maybe out to 400s occasionally, and then repeating that because those muscle contractions will, will, will basically be reflected in the resistance training. What do you feel about this? How long should this take? Just giving somebody a yeah. basic parameter. Right, well, I mean, yeah, so just from total time, so we got yep. three, we got six, eight minutes, right? Eight minutes plus another 30, we got 38 minutes. And that's what we're doing is so, like, if you look at selection, right? If you look at whether it's Ranger selection, it's SF selection, or it's Buzz, right? What we're doing is we're building timelines based off nearly, like, we don't want to do it so, you know, for hours and hours, but we also don't want to do it, like, for 13 minutes necessarily. Because in BUDS, you have to run four miles at a 28 minute pace. So we need to keep that time under tension relative, right? Not so big, not so small. And that's what we're looking at this for as well, is how much time, because it's gotta be relative. The to the one selection. big thing that Jeff and I are both talking about, if you look at this, 25 minutes, 38 minutes, 45 to 50 minutes, 50 to 60, 50 to 60. Nothing goes over an hour, guys, nothing. Not as a world record powerlifter, not as a SEAL team operator. Yeah. Think about what we're saying here. It's accumulation over a month. It is not how much you can do in a day. Yeah. And that's where it's so important because if you can sustain this particular system for six months, you will be in better shape than a guy that's killing himself and then he has to back down and then ramp up and then back down. He never makes it anywhere. Yep. He's climbing halfway up the mountain to turn back around and go back down while you're itching up the mountain every week. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Finally, you're at the top. Right, but most people's training, they get halfway up the mountain, they get injured or burned out, they gotta go back and then climb back up again. So if we were to put 365 squares on this and every single day Matt were to come in here and bust his ass, right? How many max effort days in 365 do you think you'd actually be able to go, those were useful? Very few, like probably less than a dozen or two in 365 days, mm -hmm. right? So you can't train well if you can't train. Right, and that's the big thing is, you know, everyone wants the PR, everyone wants these big sexy things, but the sexiest thing is, is consistency. <laughs> yeah. If we can make consistency sexy, then we're doing something. And that, but that's the nature of our military, right? Like, look at, look at when we're on the range. Like, how many rounds in a in a systematic, objective way go down range, right? Or skydiving, or building demolition, or whatever it may be. The objective nature of learning in our military is this, and that's I think that that's why we think it's also so so useful in our military is because th this all fits really really perfectly with the lifestyle of our military. So this is the second week we're going to undulate, which means we're going to change. So now the emphasis is the dynamic effort method. Remember we showed you on that pie chart the dynamic effort method is just as important as maxing and repetition. Where does it go? Well, in my opinion, for tactical, and because we have to add in so much running, you can't do them all in one week like a power lifter. You bet. Or a shot putter, or somebody that all they have to do is maximum power, and that's it. We need power, we need hypertrophy, and we need endurance. When you start adding all of these ingredients to the stew, yeah. the mixture's gotta be right. Yeah. And so what I truly believe is that you put dynamic on its own week. Okay, now, with that being said, day one's a dynamic effort lower going to try to stay within that 50 to 60 minute range for recovery. We're going to do warm-ups the exact same way we do on max effort. Why? The repetition effort method fixes weaknesses to volume, okay? So we're going to pick the same style but different exercises. Same muscles, different exercises. You can even take the abs away on this day and you can put glutes because we know that most people don't have good glute firing, okay? 
So once we do that and do a movement pattern of whichever one we're gonna pick, now we're gonna do that circuit for 12 to 14 minutes. That cuts off of this. Now we only got about 40 minutes left. Now the main lift is a dump dynamic or a, a deadlift or a squat, whichever one you want. If you need to work more on the trap bar, put it in at least once or twice a month. And now you're gonna work on rate of force, okay? Now rate of force is basically developing sub-maximal weights, 30 to 40% at eight sets of two to three. Why? Because if you're using a higher percentage than that, it's not fast enough. Right. We're gonna show you a little graph right now, it's called the force velocity curve. Yep. We wanna stay in that power range. That means if it gets too heavy, it's too close to isometric, it's no longer relative to being fast. Yep. And that's why we wanna be in this range, okay? Two to three reps because we want power bursts. If we go to six or eight reps, it's too long, mm -hmm. and now it's endurance. There's no way to create that much force. Accessories, instead of doing those minute sets that we did last week, we're actually gonna do pick exercises and go to complete failure. But because we do that, that's a lot of damage, we only go to two exercises. Now, depending on if you're a beginner, you might only need one set. Advanced guys, like a SEAL team guy or pro lifter, we're gonna need three sets. But you only wanna pick two exercises because maximal muscle damage is high. Now, that increases motor unit recruitment, hypertrophy, ligament, tendon, and bone density. So all of this is gonna start developing more resilient tissue, and that's the point. The warm-up and the dynamic effort day for max up or uh, dynamic upper is the same style warm-up, and I would still stay with triceps and upper back because it's gonna explode your triceps and your bench or your, uh, your push-ups through the moon, okay? With that being said, we still have the same time parameter, 50 to 60 minutes, 12 or 14 of that is soaked into GPP in the warm up. Then we go to the main lift. It's a pressing movement of any type that you want. You're gonna be using rate of force with eight sets of three. The reason that upper body is always three reps and sometimes the lower is two is the distance of motion. A, a bench press or a push up is not near the motion of a squat or a deadlift right. and the damage. So the volume can be a little higher. Now what we do in a three week wave is we go 30, 35, 40, 30, 35, 40. Guess what? That never changes until your max goes up. Right. Do not get it twisted. You don't start at say 100 pounds. Well, I did 100, then 105, then 110. So this week I'm gonna do 115. Doesn't work that way. 12 weeks later when you remax, your bench goes up 20 pounds. Now you raise it up and yep. base it off of that percentage. Yep. Pretty simple to understand. Accessories, two exercises again because you're doing failure sets instead of sets of a minute. Motor unit recruitment, hypertrophy and density. What exercises would I use for accessories? Probably a tricep, an upper back, or you could use some kind of a lateral rear delt or side delt depending on if you have enough shoulder mass. I have never seen a person that has a ton of shoulder problems with massive rear delts meaning bigger the rear delts, the more protected you are. So on the third day, we're gonna do a repetition effort method. We're gonna to try to keep the time parameter a little lower than the core lift days and weakness emphasis on upper body. My personal opinion, you're gonna have stability in the shoulder, which is the kettlebell bench is gonna hit. Pull ups, because most people are weak at them. If you're super weak at them, then do them with this, the assisted bands that we had. Uh, but get the reps in and then cross body tricep. This is another huge tip that we talked a little bit about with the alternate toe touches, but we did not upper body. Cross body tricep, that would be a cable or band across the body like this, coming this way. Now, listen to what it says, add an extra set on the weak side. So if you're pushing the right side, most people are right-handed, I'm left-handed, and you get 15 on this side, you flip over to the other side, and you only get six or seven, do an extra set on the weak side. That's gonna start counterbalancing everything and not only helping your pressing, but saving your shoulders under extreme load. Right. Now, Jeff's gonna talk a lot about the running. It drastically changes on this week. Yep. Like I mentioned before, so we want the reflection of the running or the, the, the conditioning side to mimic, in a way, the contraction rate of the resistance side, okay? So we're in a, a, a power and speed sort of module, you wanna call it that. So what we're gonna do here is, ideally this is done on a track, like 
because it really is easier to manage the distance and uh, that's what I'm recommending people to, or, or if you're in a big park area where you can drop some big cones because these distances give you give you reprieve right and that's that's what I actually meant we're, we establish distance to give you relief okay so you can rest okay so what we're looking at here is you're gonna run 100 meters at 90% effort. Now this is this is coming after a warm up as well, okay? Especially when we start talking about this and this much effort, okay? So, are we? Do we have to be? How? Where are we getting this 90? Well, that's where we want you to practice these things so you can establish these because 90% today is not going to be like we said we said before won't be the same 90%. It's relative to your now, okay? So, you're gonna run 100 meters. Is at 90% effort, and then you'll walk 100 meters, right? And you're gonna do that four times, okay? Then you're gonna run 100 meters at 80% effort, walk 100 meters, and repeat that four times, right? And you can see what we're doing is we're taking some of the distance away or the effort away, okay? And then we manage it other things like say, hey, we're gonna as we as the the percentage goes down, the rep range goes up. Okay, because what we're still trying to keep that speed relative. Okay, because here, why are these percentages? Okay, so if you're going to do a four mile timed run at Buds, right, we, we, you can kind of eyeball and say, what's the average speed that person is covering? Well, okay, if they were the average, like the Usain Bolt runs 28 miles an hour, right? So 60% of that 28 miles an hour, if you were to take that speed, that 60% of effort will always get you under the knee, the tested time. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're saying, well, 60% effort isn't that high. It's 60% of your max speed. Well, no, so, that, I think the other thing you guys can talk about too a little bit, and we'll hit on this and show a graph, but I like to use from being an advanced lifter, RPE. Mm -hmm. So 90%, Basing on your one rep is hauling ass. That's hauling like ass. I'm a 900 pound squatter. Yep. That's 800 and something pounds. Yep. So, but if you base it off of RPE, which is rate of perceived exertion, it's what it is that day. Yep. yep. So I'd like to use that floating system, but like I said, percentages work well too. Yeah. So it's kind of that's really what we're saying. Like it's RP, it's perceived, perceived but it's the point is it's changing, and you're making a decision to change this percentage so you can increase the work output on and, this day. And what I also liked about it is you notice his percentage has changed. So the first week he went 60, 80. Now he starts with the hardest and goes a little easier. Right. His body is changing its output. It's not trying to understand as much. It's not, you're not giving it the same thing over and over again. And that's where we see the biggest problem in the military, right. even in conditioning, same thing over and over again. Right. He's changing percentages, the way it's listed, and now the body has to follow the law of accommodation. You bet. Yeah. And that's huge. And that's so like, we're really just looking at this, like this, these are creating stress so we can create an adaptation with this workload. Now that's really what we're looking at. So we go to day five, it's very similar, okay? So here we're all hundreds, real high velocity. Now this is high velocity. This would be like, hey, you're a, a Olympic sprinter, 100, 200. This is your four and 800 type guy. And this is really good to the military because I know, I know that what we're doing from the advertising standpoint, like I'm not running a mile to pursue somebody. What we say is we're gonna maximally pursue somebody on foot between four and 800 meters. And that's kind of how the police force was well. So that's why we're working off of some of these, these distances too. Cause it's like, I'm gonna have you run 400 meters at six. That's, that's a good, that's a lot of effort here. Okay. 60% 400 meters. And then you're gonna walk 200 meters out. Cause that's where I really, we want to stress you out because that's, we, we want to teach you to not just stress you out, but we want to create the stress and then have you manage it. Like that's actually, we want to actively stress you out. And that's why I'm walking you. Like I'm stressed out, now deal with it. Oh, here comes the stress again, right? We modulated the stress, went from 400 to 60%. Now we're at 200 and we, we went up, right? But the distance went down, reps gone up, and now we're gonna do the same thing. We're back at 100 and now we're at max effort, okay? Now, is our max effort here gonna be the same here? No, this will be much slower. But what we're saying is this, this maximal effort is still gonna be faster than any test you're ever gonna to have to run on an average velocity. So notice that he's putting his max effort at the end and his max effort at the beginning. 
He's changing what the body has to accommodate to and adjust to, which is going to push his body faster with less work. Yep. Because if he were to do just this twice a week, he would get in better shape. But after about three to six weeks, his body would whoop, plateau and then boom, hit the ground. This is constantly causing. What I want you to realize is his thought process on running and my thought process on lifting are very similar. We're not trying to do anything you can't recover from. Yep. That's the key because if you can maintain this two week wave, which will show more than that, but you can maintain this two week wave in a month or six months, how much did you adapt to? Yep. And what I will say for you, especially for the beginners or ones that are new to this, or like guys that are big muscle bound, but they don't have a good aerobic base, these walk, 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 and these walks, really, th these are arbitrary, okay? If, if we need to extend this to 150 or 200 meters to, again, accommodate this four times, then we should. Now, unless this walks, like I gotta walk six minutes to, no. Like that's, it, it, again, it's all relative, but that's what we're doing. It's okay to adjust your rest period because if you're adjusting your rest periods to increase your performance acutely, okay, great, great thing, but there's a point where it won't help. But allow that to happen, and that's why we want you guys also to have these programs so you can take note. And you're like, hey, you're gonna run through this program. Let's say you get to like here, and you're like, a, you, you get through this pretty well, you get through this pretty well, you get to here, and you're like, whoo, I'm on my third one, and I'm shut down. You, you recognize that and go, no, put a pin in it and go, I'm gonna come back this this next time and see if I can't get to set four and five. So do you understand what he's saying? He's saying to auto-regulate. And auto-regulation is super huge. What we're trying to show you here, guys, this is not the blueprint. This is the blueprint to think. Yeah. And this is everything I tell people in his manuals and my manuals. Nobody reads the first three pages, which is we are trying to change your cognitive thought process. You don't have to follow this verbatim, but the skeleton's there for you to make the progression at wherever you're starting or wherever you want to be. In my opinion, we wrote this for elite. Now, we can dumb this down or we can bring this up depending on what that person needs and what they can adapt to. So what he's telling you is adjust. Now, the other thing that you start to realize is this isn't gonna take probably more than 45 minutes if you can do it correctly. That. And that's not gonna take more than 45 minutes. Again, you didn't stimulate the body for more than an hour in a day. You could recover from that, right. right? So remember guys, don't get confused and get mad. I don't understand any of this. You understand it by practicing and doing. That's it. Like I, I, that's the thing that probably frustrates me and probably more than anything that people go, man, I'm having a real hard time with this. And I go, well, how long have you been practicing and it's Like, well, I started on Monday and I go, it's Wednesday, man. Like, <laughs> like you, it's, it, I get it. Like he and I are wired differently. Like I, and I know he does really, I enjoy the minutia of this. I like being under a bar. I like the, the discomfort we'll call it, but it's, it's not just, and so, do we expect everyone to have the same? No, no, no. But but here's the difference is you all decided to join the military. You all carry guns, right? It is a pillar of our military infrastructure that you at least understand that there is a state of physical readiness that, well, as far as I'm concerned, you stood there and swore upon it. So I'm done with the, the excuses. Here's what we've got. Here you have two people that actually give a darn. And so here, here's the solution, and so it's up to you to hear it. So I think we have basically exhausted every avenue we can to make you better and do it the smart way. Now what me and Jeff are going to do is sit down and we're going to just talk about some other factors that we feel are mega important to making sure that you can even do this kind of stuff. Because at the end of the day, it's not what you can do, it's what you can recover from, and you need to understand that there's more to this than just what you're doing in the gym. All right, guys, so we want to throw in some extra for you because I feel stopping at just training is just is not right. We need to tell you guys that being a champion and either world-class powerlifting, trying to transfer some of this knowledge over to you in the military being a SEAL is a lot more than what you're doing inside the gym. The first thing that we need to understand is managing stress. If training is your only stressor, you can train way harder, and that's why the East Germans and Soviets figured out so much on how to work out properly was because they put guys in barracks and just beat them and make them sleep at certain times. And that's why you find a lot of the old Soviet coaches went to China to work with their Olympic teams. Still do it, yeah. Because they're not going to go over to America. They have no control. Right. So the key is you need to make your own control. And this is building in naps. Now, Charles Pollock was really big into naps. 
he believed that doing a nap anything over 30, 40 minutes would actually mess up your parasympathetic system. So I always felt that doing naps for about 20 to 25 minutes helped me tremendously recover from my world-class weights. I'm sure you used them a lot training for buds and seals when you could. Yeah, so, I and mean, that's really what it comes down to is like, I was, the joke you just say is naps are wasted on kids, right? <laughs> I mean, not really if you've ever been a parent, but <laughs> like, but you're right though. Like I, I what I, kind of the way I do with recovery is I always ask people, it's like, hey man, when you're sick, what do you do? It's like, oh, I focus on the vitamin C and all these sort of things. I'm like, well, when you're training intensely, as far as your nervous system is concerned, what the hell do you think you just put it through? You just injured it. Biologically, you've injured it. I was like, so why don't we treat ourselves like we're injured and sick every day in that yeah. sense? And it, that's kind of always been my mindset. And then it's like, we got to structure what that means. But yeah. we wait until we're sick, then it's too late when we should be doing that preemptive all the time. Yeah. So one of the big things that I think, other than naps, is something that's available. Obviously, we have all these crazy methods of things we could do. We want to talk about ones that are readily available to everyone. Right. Hot, cool contrast showers. Yep. Increasing vasodilation, vasoconstriction, raising natural growth hormone levels, yep. and helping the body to actually restore itself by using the pumping mechanism from the hot and cold. Yep. How much of that did you use as a seal? Yeah, like that was a pretty common thing, like especially like it's one thing to kind of like dig through the research and kind of see what it means because like, you know, from a hypertrophy standpoint, maybe you want to stay away from ice and certain things, kind of research saying that, but just generally speaking, contrast, it is the contrast that creates value. We don't want a lot of cold water submersion for a long time and the same way we don't want a heat submersion for a long time. We also, we know that from a standpoint of like a lot of the research saying like if the water from a standpoint of Fahrenheit, if it's, if it's, if it's below like 51 to 52 degrees, your nervous system actually becomes very sympathetic because of it. Unless you grew up in a really cold environment or your Wim Hof type situation, right? So I think that's the big thing is to is the contrast is it, it doesn't have to be extreme hot, extreme cold. It's just that that, that contrast creates the value, especially with, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that so, perceived relaxation. Too. Yeah. So what we would do is we'd run the, the cold water at around 55 to 60 yep. which isn't burnt, burnt cold but it's it's, it's enough cold to snap. it's cold and then we put the hot up to around 108 yep and what yep. we would do is one minute in the hot try to get the whole body hit yep and then one minute in the cold yep. and we would do that five rounds at, at professional lifting and i could not believe the difference it made in my restoration yeah yeah, yeah. some people like have a real good acute recovery from those and that that, that the reason you probably i mean you're you're you affected by it but also he kept it to a reasonable duration. Like it, it isn't. We need to we need to set the ego aside and go. If I stay in this for three and four minutes, there's going to be more value. No, no, no. It's it's only the moment of contrast. Like you're trying to get him in hot water, increase that core temperature, body temperature. When you put him in then in cold water, it is that next fifteen or twenty seconds that creates that sort of enzymatic cascade or mm -hmm. um, or, or that reaction. So. Yeah. It's not about long duration, it's about capturing the contrast. Yeah, there was a lot of Soviet data that we got translated down at IPI when Bomberito was there. Yeah, yeah. And we showed that optimization is one minute on, one minute off, on, off, five cycles, and that's max. Yep. Now, the next thing that I think kind of starts leading into the nutrition side, I think um, the naps and the hot, cool contrast are about the closest things that I feel are premium ability with minimal shit. Right, right. But now you get into and start going into the nutrition supplementation side, we know 75% of the population is magnesium deficient. This is not only going to cause more stress both neurally, but also doesn't let the muscles recover properly. And, and at food digestion too. So now you're really, you know, lack of magnesium is you're going to affect digestion, right? And that's, well, that's everything. That's, that's, yeah. it's immune function right there. Yeah. So magnesium, usually for most of you guys, is going to be around 1,000 milligrams per day, and you want to preload that when you can lay down for a while. It's not that it puts you out like you know, like a painkiller or something, but it does lower everything down enough for you to actually start recovering. Yeah. So the big thing is if you're not sleeping very well, you're not going to be able to recover very well. The next thing is there is some data, and I have always been a great sleeper. I've never liked to stay up late, and I think that was one of my biggest advantages. Yeah. I feel... That if you're truly taking your, taking your training seriously, you have to be in bed or laying down by around 8.30 to 9.30. There is no, you can't get by with that because at about 1 a.m. you get that big growth hormone yep. spurt. That's when your body's recovering. And if you're not dead asleep by then, yep. 
Yep. It really just kind of gets pushed by the wayside. Yeah, and I, this is kind of where like the jokes start flying too, because everyone like I, I'm I'm trying to put myself as like a, a, a hearing your words, and you're like, well, you know, you should be able to get to bed at this time, and you at one a.m. you get this, and it's like, like, well, how could you possibly know? And I like go. Oh, you, you, if you look out in that thing we call the sky, that, that, that big ball, a big burning glass of big, you know the sun, like every living organism on this planet is is going to has to accommodate that rise and fall of the circadian rhythm. And so we're talking about optimization. Whether you pay attention to it or not, that sun is going to rise and fall at a very predictable rate, and all your hormones are going to be released based on the rise and fall of that big mm -hmm. burning ball of gas. When I tell people <laughs> this all the time, that half the reason I do not like to travel overseas and I charge so yeah. much to do seminars is because it messes me up for thirty days. Oh man, thirty and, days, and, and it, because people won't understand that if you don't have a regular sleep sky cycle, he sounds like a crazy person. Because I spent 11 years of my life only sleeping about three hours at best a day, <laughs> you know, for years. And it was like, I never could catch up until I finally, like, life dictated that I was like, I become a proper adult. <laughs> and now at 43, I'm like, I'm, I'm healthier, I'm fitter, I'm faster, I'm leaner, I'm stronger, and all those sort of things. It's like, I attribute it entirely to the unsexy side of Sleep yeah. and nutrition. And if you don't believe it, we'll show you a graph right here that just came out within the last year or two on sleep quality and amount and body fat percentage. It, now, it's one of those things, sleep is never, you're never going to see sleep that goes, well, less sleep is better. There's never, ever been an, an <laughs> ever been any sleep study in any capacity anywhere in the world where they they concluded that less sleep or less quality of sleep is better. Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. Now, the big thing I think that we have to talk about as well is regulating stress. Now, for most of us, what we need to be able to do is try to compartmentalize. That was the other big advantage I had for breaking all-time world records was is that if my training was my only stressor at that point, I was I was growing on it like a chia pet. Yeah. But as soon as I had a relationship or a family issue or something that got in the way, it actually affected me poorly. And here's the thing. For most of you guys, this is nitpicky because I was pushing world records, shit yeah. that no person had ever done before. And so to have all those keys in place was huge. But nonetheless, no matter what your goals are or where you're at, they're still heavily important because you only have so much water in your glass. Mm -hmm. And you might want to train with a full glass of water to pour out, but if you only got half a glass, you're digging a hole. Yeah. And now you got a big problem. So tell us how you would try to kind of balance out that stress if you had a perfect world at that time. Yeah, you know, like I think that the first thing that I tried to attack was sleep. You know, I, I was fortunate when I was time in the military, we, we had some really fantastic sleep folks that were really looking into it because they knew it was a problem, right? <clears throat> so, you know, the first thing was like, you gotta admit, we have to first admit that less sleep is not better. Like, well, I do fine off five. You can say that, but the first thing we try to do, if you're not sleeping well, is we try to build sleep quality. Sleep quality is, a, is always, in my opinion, should be a priority before sleep quantity. Because it, it, it just really, it puts more stress. Like if I can't sleep, then sleep becomes its own source of stress. And go like, I, I'm not gonna sleep. And a lot of guys do that and wear lack of sleep as a badge of honor, mm -hmm. okay? So the big thing is, it, it is super unsexy. now. If we're talking about folks in a selection environment or a deployment environment, the best you can do, or like a third shift, you're working a night shift like in the police department, the, the best thing you can do for this is you have to build everything off of when am I gonna sleep and when, am I, when I'm awake, when am I gonna eat? Yeah, and think about this guys, what we're talking about here is planning. <clears throat> now, we just showed you how we plan our training and how we laid it out, and it took a whole freaking board to lay out one week of training. Right. But think about this. When's the last time you took a board or a piece of paper out and laid out your nutrition and your sleep? Uh, I can probably tell you zero if you did. Right. And so if you guys were to take those things just as important, and I'm going to just throw a number out. If you were to take that more important than what we just showed you on the board and take 20% off of what we just showed you on the board, yep. you're going to make more performance than if you could do everything we showed you on the board and you're not thinking about any of that. Right. Right. And, and I think that that's, be, be, we get so caught up on getting somewhere 
before we've even got a plan. You're like, I want to be a world-class bench press, world-class this, or I want to be the best shooter, the best skydiver. It's like no one becomes that without actually getting to the point because there are very few world-class anything that haven't come to this conclusion, mm -hmm. right? I need to prioritize sleep. I need to prioritize my dietetics and I need to prioritize a way to manage my stress because I know I have to have it to be a high performer, yep. right? And then that, that's the big thing is like, so we, when you're, if you're chasing records, right, as a, as a world-class powerlifter or you're trying to get into special forces, like you, you, you have to also go, well, some of my training are gonna, is going to be so caustic, it might feel like it's detrimental. But that's also when we're talking about, hey, you got to do real heavy, hard shit sometimes to create that adaptation. And so that being the case, because whether you're going to put all that weight on your body and that stress, like if he screwed it up, there's imminent possible death, right, and certain injury, right? And that is where there's a really, really beautiful correlation between the powerlifting world that Matt's experienced and the special operations world is that mistakes are usually catastrophic at that level. And it's like, well, how do we help prevent catastrophic mistakes? Being present, yep. right? When you are under the bar breaking world records, you weren't fucking thinking about like, man, what am I gonna, like, there's a new movie coming out or my girlfriend is this or my wife is that or, like it is ultimately present. And when you're on target in a combat environment, you are present and that is what we're trying to get you to do. It's like, it's kind of easy to be present under a bar, mm -hmm. like hopefully. It's hard to be present in how do I, how do I mitigate my stress? How do I downregulate and how do I do that stuff? Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, tough. That's a huge issue. And I think the big thing is, guys, is that start laying out plans. Start figuring out what you are trying to do, where your weaknesses are. If your weakness is you're only sleeping like Jeff was three hours, none of the training is going to help to prioritize if he doesn't prioritize mm -hmm. the sleep. Where's your biggest kink in your armor that's what you guys should be thinking about focusing on and trying to understand yep. so i hope this video has helped you guys tremendously jeff and i have had a hell of a time doing this all afternoon yep. we could go another three days <laughs> and keep more. going we want to make it as tight as we can so you guys keep your focus and keep your thought process but i think if you take anything away from all the stuff we showed you is know where your weaknesses are make sure that they are the primary focus understanding that recovery sleep and everything is just as important as working out understanding that you need to rotate what you're doing and you can't do it all the time and getting better at running doesn't necessarily mean more running it means balancing out your muscles from both left to right and anterior to posterior if we do all of those things and do it the best that we can you're going to have a better shot at making at whatever level you want to be or lasting as long as you need to last to get the chances to go to dev group, do the special ops stuff, make it through basic training and select the school that you want. And also, I think the last thing that we need to hit on is making sure that you're eating right. You know, you can train all you want, it, but you know, if you have, you know, a brand new Lamborghini out in the parking lot and you think you're gonna go to Costco and fill up on economy fuel, you got a big, big problem. And I think that's one of the biggest issues we see in the military, both in what lack of education is but also what they're trying to even feed people in the mess hall yeah like that like we before we open up pandora's box and like here's the thing is like we could we could and i've been guilty we could cast blame and all these sort of things but at the end of the day you have to be a professional soldier like i i believe that from a standpoint of like we can't just keep saying well things are tough we got to deal with it it's like no like you these things need to be done and and I think that that's the education piece. And that's where I want to emphasize the leadership is like, it's not okay that we're in this position where Matt and I are feel this real genuine need to do this video because it's not happening internally. And, and I'm not okay with that. Like I, I spent 11 years in and had an amazing time, but I also, I need to be critical of it. I need to be critical of myself. I need to be critical of the things I'm doing. And I need to be critical of what I'm going to do if I have a goal. Yeah, I mean, everything can be done better. I could have trained smarter and better. Yeah. You could have trained smarter and better. We all could have done better. That doesn't mean what we did at that time was wrong. But what is wrong is what information is available at that time if it's not used at 100% capacity, that's a problem. Yeah. So back yeah. in the 70s when Kazmaier was hitting his biggest numbers, they didn't know how to train back then. That wasn't his fault. 
Yep. But now, if Kaz was today, then people like that, they would have a big issue if they weren't changing what they did 30, 40 years right. ago. And that's the biggest problem we're having in the military is they want to do what they thought was right in the 60s now. No. It's completely changed. We, ha we have to accept evolution. Like, it's in the, you know, talking with military leadership and whatnot, their, their typically excuse is that, well, we need to get everyone to do it or not at all. And, or it's, it, it doesn't suit genders or it doesn't this. And I'm like, okay, I wonder what the people on the other side of the battlefield are going to, you know, like, really, that's the question is like, are the people that we potentially become in conflict, are they doing those things? No. Right? Are we Because we as America want to say that we've got all these things, we have a great military, great, all these sort of things, but, and, and I agree, but we're not saying that things are broken. We see them and go, wait, the resources that are available for our military, infinite, right? right? The, the, the people that could utilize this information, education, it's all of them, right? We're, we're looking at an organization that needs it, and... Well, they have to also understand that, like, if they're if they're not going to resolve it, right, the issues are going to get worse and worse and worse, and they're going to have to, right. Yeah. And so then the question is, is do we lean forward and educate our guys right now, or or do we just keep throwing like YouTube videos at our soldiers? Yeah, and that's the big problem. Is I think right now we're trying to put band aids on bullet holes when we need to be really mending what's going on, and that's just coming in and looking. I mean, we look. At, I look at my training and figure out. What's the weakest link? You look at your training. Yeah. That's what the Army needs to do now. That's what you need to be doing with your training. So if something doesn't make sense to you, you can get a hold of Jeff on his website. Yeah. You can get a hold of me on my website. We can custom tailor it to you no matter what your abilities are. But at the end of the day, we have given you all the tools you need to be as good as you can without having to go into something for two years. I mean, we just covered more than most people learn in an undergrad yeah. in, in a college setting. Yeah. So now it's up to you guys to dig further, figure out what you guys need, make your life better both in and out of the military. Right. Yeah. All right, well, take it easy. We're going to go get some grub. See you guys later. Lately I've been living like I can't take a loss.